Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. And for a limited time, you're going to get the Keto Bundle. New members will get a free pork butt, two pounds of ground beef, and bone-in chicken thighs free in their first box. Plus, you're going to get free shipping. What is ButcherBox? You might ask yourself or somebody else. Well, it's an organization that gives customers access to high-quality meat at an incredibly affordable price. And they're never going to charge you for shipping. With ButcherBox, you are going to get 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, heritage-bred pork, and more. Delivered to your doorstep, saving you time, money. I actually think the time on that might be the most important aspect. But regardless, no matter where you live, every family now has access to high-quality cuts of meat at the most affordable prices. If you're into supporting brands that believe in caring about animal welfare, supporting farmers, treating the planet with respect, and a belief in creating better meals that can be enjoyed together, then ButcherBox is definitely the brand for you. If the sound of 100% grass-fed and pasture-raised beef, free-range USDA-certified organic chicken, heritage breed pork, wild-caught seafood like salmon, cod, scallops, and haddock, or maybe just the butcher box bacon being delivered directly to your doorstep on the frequency of your choosing. Sounds good. I highly recommend that you check them out. It's an unbeatable value. The average cost is less than $6 per meal. I myself find that the most expensive portion of the grocery store for me is where the meat is. Save yourself money and the time of going by there. And as I mentioned, the box options and delivery frequencies, they're crafted and suited to fit your needs. You can cancel at any time with no penalty. And again, for those of you who haven't signed up, if you're interested right now, they're offering the Keto Bundle for the listeners. New members are going to get a free pork butt, two pounds of ground beef, and bone-in chicken thighs for free. Go to butcherbox.com slash cleared hot. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes on the audio only Still haven't figured out how to do that on YouTube without the crazy hyperlink. But those are your two options. Pro tip, they're going to ask you for your email when you land at that homepage for the podcast offer. Make sure you put that in there to access the deal. ButcherBox.com slash ClearedHot. This episode is also brought to you by the Personal Defense Network. 2020, whew, it has been some ups and some downs. Probably more downs than ups, or maybe for some, more ups than down. But I digress. In this up and down that we've experienced together, a lot of people have realized that police, first responders, they're not always going to be there. They don't always have the ability to be there when you want them to be. And the ability to defend yourself and your family has never been more important, along with your preparation to act as your own first responder. A lot of people are reaching out far and wide looking for information on training tips, techniques, just resources so they can increase their preparedness. And if you're not familiar with Personal Defense Network, PDN is what I'm going to refer to them as from here on out, has the world's largest collection of high-quality educational self-defense material on the internet. It's actually not even a close second. There is everything on there from firearms to self-defense to home defense training. PDN will give you the ability to come to your own rescue, quite literally. PDN is an educational community that provides vital, easy-to-understand real-world tips, techniques, and tactics. The PDN team has the world's best instructors, and they've been delivering life-saving information to people like you for over 15 years. It's a great resource to continue to sharpen the blade and learn how to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Now, for the listeners, this one is the first time I've ever had a code where you need to text it in to take advantage of this offer. But if you are interested, text the code cleared hot. And the way I'm looking at it is all uppercase, all one word, to the number 47 47 47. And a discount will be applied automatically for you at checkout. What discount you may ask? Well, their premium membership will be just three dollars for the first full year. That is correct. I didn't say uh, something I didn't mean to. It's three bucks 
for a membership that is normally $69. With that, you will get access to hundreds of videos and classes. And once you become a member, you can go through the volume of information that they have and determine what is right for you. The classes are designed to make you feel like you're there with the trainer. And if this sounds interesting to you, again, you're going to need to text the code cleared hot, all uppercase, all one word, to 474747. And the discount will be automatically applied at your checkout. PDN is cutting edge. They're not going to put you to sleep. They're not tired old training videos. They spent many months developing content specifically for the times that we're all working our way through right now. They're not going to sit there and just tell you what it is they think you should do. They're going to explain the whys and hows, and they're going to try to help develop your skills on your own. All of PDN's contributors are active educators. They are experts in their fields, and they teach life-saving skills to military personnel, law enforcement, and people just like you and I all around the world. Again, if this sounds interesting, you're going to need to text the code cleared hot, all uppercase, all one word, to 474747, and your discount will automatically apply at checkout. And that's it on the business side of the house. Let's talk about my guest today because... She's awesome. Her name, Nikki Selby, or you could just call her ma'am because she just retired. And I, well, not just retired, but recently retired from the United States Navy with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. Now, what she did in the military, I would describe, and I'm sure she would too, is the entire time in the, I'd say healthcare, but critical care, um, critical response team, emergency medicine pipeline. You know, she wasn't in that the entire time, but she navigated her way in and out of that for the entire time that she was in the military. She was a flight nurse overseas in Afghanistan. She deployed to places like Haiti. Um, to be honest, it's hard to describe the things that she was able to do in her career. And I've always wanted to be able to sit down and talk with somebody who worked on that side of the spectrum. I would only go into medical facilities or I would avoid them at all costs. Uh, and the only time that you would go in there would there'd be something catastrophic or you were injured yourself. It's not a place that most people want to go. And it's just a fascinating uh, look behind the curtain of what it is that they did slash do still. She's not doing it still because she's out. But then again, after she got out, she got surged to New York to work in the front lines when New York was just exploding with COVID cases. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let her talk because she does a great job of explaining herself and her background and her experiences. Episode number 160 with the powerhouse herself, Lieutenant Commander Nikki Selby. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute, give it to me. I need it. What are we going to talk about? Well, I, I thought you were coming on the tail end of a hunt, oh. which it's going to be your first. So yes. instead, it's flip flop. Yes. Let's talk about what you have, what your expectations are going into a hunt. We'll just open up there. I'm fascinated because, oh, well, I was going to be fascinated on how it went for you. But now I'm curious as to tell me how much you know about what you're getting into, Mr. <laughs> Baker Levitt. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Baker. Um, I really have no idea. So I've always wanted to hunt. Mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by people who, who do it, and I've asked plenty of times, hey, can I go along with you? And I, I just don't think, I don't know if people don't want to take newer people, but I always go, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And then it nothing really happens. So I saw this hunting recruitment project online and one of my friends did it a few months ago mm -hmm. and so i was like what is this about and so i reached out hunting to them. recruitment yes just so basically an on-ramp for people who are interested in hunting is yes it? Okay. so it sounds like they take new hunters um hunters recruitment project that's the name of it on instagram um but one of my friends who's a brand new hunter she went a couple months ago and so i asked her what is this and she said oh it's this project and they they take new hunters i don't know how often so i reached out to him on ig and then the next oh, thing I know, IG. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate networking. Yes, it kind uh, of is. So kind of. I get a message from Baker and, <laughs> and he says, hey, it's me, Baker. <laughs> I was like, oh, hey. <laughs> did you know him previously? I did. From, How did you meet the bald headed one? I met him in Vegas at SHOT Show oh, originally. 
<laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am. The 2021 shot show got the trap door pulled on it. Yeah, I, I'm a little. I'm I'm kind of happy too. Have you been many times? No, this year. This year's was the first. So. Yeah. Well, they're all the same. Everyone that's happened before and everyone that would have happened in the future. Yeah. They would have all been the same. I figured. I avoid it like it's most people just call it the shit show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it terminates in too much alcohol at the circle bar. Yes. With business plans being made that never get followed through <laughs> on. It's basically what shot show is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the company I work for now, I would have had to go this year. So mm-hmm. I am a little bit happy that it didn't. What out. company are you working for now? I work for Combat Medical Systems, um, which falls under Safeguard Medical. Okay. What do they specialize in? So we do a lot of the medical gear for military and... Um, like IFAC kits and stuff like exactly. that? Exactly. Yes. So. You know what sucks is that I had to look that term up after being issue one for years. <laughs> I just like, yeah, it's an IFAC kit. And like, what's that? I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> Oh, Let's individual first aid kit. <laughs> I'm medical and I didn't really know the term either for a while. So yeah, don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I forget how many acronyms I try to try to describe to people, the military life. I'm like, yeah, it's a different universe, a mm-hmm. different language. Yes. And uh, I still, I can't, I'm partially fluent in military. I can speak Navy. I can't speak Marine though. Well, that's the thing. So every service <laughs> has their own language yeah. because now working in this job, I do a lot with army oh, and, no. and air force. And I'm like, what the hell, what are you yeah. talking about? What is this? So yes. yeah, not a fan. No. Well, I'm glad you're getting into hunting. I only got into it. Well, I have very limited hunting this year. I don't even know if I can call it much of a hunting season, but about three or four years ago. Um, and I found it to be very cool. Some people are against it from an ethical or moral perspective and right. whatever, they can have whatever thoughts they want to on it. Me, there wasn't that issue, but I really liked the process of the planning, going, field dressing in the field, processor or yourself, and then a freezer full of meat for the whole year long. Right. Yeah. The most expensive part of the grocery store seems to be the meat aisle. And I just like, chick, 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 just cruise on past it. I don't even care anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's the point. That's why I wanted to learn this because- I don't know the way of the world these days, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> I think the more you can know and understand about how to, not that you're going to have to be thrown into like a survival situation. I personally believe the preppers are a touch too far towards the left or the right, whatever they would call themselves. But the more you know, like self-awareness, the ability to you know provide for yourself, I think the better. Right. right. The better. I'm Where gonna... do you call home though? My home right my home right now is Southern California. So not a lot of hunting opportunities there. You're going to have to travel to mostly. Yes. I mean, some people are telling me that there are a lot of opportunity there. So who are these people? Military people. <laughs> Military. But you and I both know this. They don't well, know shit. No, I guess you can actually like hunt on Pendleton too. Like they have. That would be interesting yes. because Pendleton is huge. Right. I wonder what they would. I bet you they have some deer. Yes. <sighs> Or other things that I can't. I bet you there's hogs on there too. Wild boar. Mm, There's a wild boar problem in Cali. They're invasive and they just destroy things. Right. I bet you could. I didn't spend too much time on Pendleton. Definitely deer. I'm not sure. I don't think I've ever seen. Yeah. I'd be. Yeah. But you're going to be on deer. You're going to have to travel. Right. Like for people, if you ever get into bigger game like elk, you'll be up here like a Western Rocky Mountain state, Arizona, Colorado, Utah. They're kind of awesome. I would love to go on an elk hunt. So my first interaction with an elk was with my bow. And bow distances are just jammed straight in your face. Yes. Because I actually, I didn't want to rifle hunt. Like, this is not fair. It's not. I I don't. I agree. Well, and then I said that and rifle hunters started hitting me up. Screw you, man. Do you know how hard rifle hunting is? I'm like, whoa, (laughs) take it easy. I'm not trying to insult your hobby. I'm just saying for me, I like the challenge of a bow. But my first... Let's see here. The first interaction I had with an elk was inside of 30 yards. The one I got two years ago came to three yards, head on, screaming in my face. I have the video. I'll show you after. It came after you? It didn't come after me. Um, He was fully in the rut, which means hormonally as a male was not thinking correctly. Right. (laughs) They were enticing him in with cow calls, the female noise, and he just came like, hey, let's do this. And then kind of looked at me and I looked at him. I was running through self-defense situations in my head. I didn't know if it was going to stop. It was just walking at me and walking at me and walking at me. And my shot was maybe somewhere between 10 to 13 or 14 yards. So very close. It's different than looking through the glass 
right. of a rifle. Which Did you just get into some long-range marksmanship action? I did. I was IG stalking you a little bit, saw you behind the <laughs> scope of a rifle. Yes. Interesting yes. journey. You're, I'm assuming you're rifle hunting in Georgia. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Um, I So I retired last year. Retired, retired? Reti- yeah, almost 20. 20 years? 20, almost 24. <sighs> God bless you. <laughs> I did 17 and it felt like 30. 17. Medical retirement. Oh, okay. <laughs> 24 is a long stretch. It's a really long stretch. Yeah. All Marines? I was Navy. Yep. Oh. I was Navy Medical. So FMF? we were with the Marines. Yes. Okay. Yep. So. How'd you decide on the Navy? So I decided growing up, my dad had me playing tennis my entire life. I thought that was the direction I was going to go into. Kind of got in the tennis some... life. Yes. <laughs> I also <laughs> thought I was going to go in the tennis life. I'm joking. I did. Okay. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never. I never once thought about tennis. <laughs> I, I, you don't really come off as a type. So. Um, yeah, but I mean, ever since I started walking, it was tennis, tennis, tennis. So I thought at least I could translate that into a college scholarship of some sort or whatever. Mm-hmm. Got into some trouble in high school. Got As kicked off the tennis team my junior year, which is right at that point where you shouldn't be getting kicked off teams. Probably at the point where <laughs> if you're going to get a scholarship, people are paying attention to you. Right, exactly. So I was a little bit lost my senior year because I just didn't know what I was going to do and really didn't set myself up for just going to college or getting any other kind of assistance for college. And my dad was kind of like, well, you're on your own at 18. <laughs> my brother kind of went through a similar path and he joined the Navy. So I was like, oh, I guess I'll just follow him. <laughs> did he do a career as well? or No, he did six years and got up. Which is about average, I think. Yeah. Four to eight for most people. Well, he got stuck in a rate that put him on a ship the entire time. And he was like, what was his rate? Fuck this. He's an EW. Electronic warfare. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they do, but I know what an EW is. Yeah, I don't know what they do either. My original yeah. rate was OS, Operations Specialist, Specialist. Yes. Radar Scope Operator. Yep. If you and I, like if this table was a boat and our life depended on me <laughs> reading a radar scope to navigate us through any type of danger, yeah. we're going to die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you guys grow up? We grew up in ultimately Las Vegas. My okay. dad was Air Force, so he retired there. I was eight, so that's pretty much where I claim. Oh. Where's that? What's the name of that base? I know it's on the north side of town. Nellis. Nellis. Okay. Yep. So they're all still there. Brothers there. Well, he moved back, and then my parents still live there. So. So you went early on, right after high school, into the Navy. I did. As did I. Yep. Similar trajectory. How'd it go for you? So the whole plan was, you know, again, didn't really know where I was going, what I was going to do. So I was like, I'll join the Navy, do the whole GI Bill thing, give me, you know, five years to figure it out and then go to college. And five years turned into almost 24. How was that first five? Did you go, I'm assuming HM? Yes. Okay. So I was a corpsman. I did my first year as just a general duty corpsman. I was at a clinic out in Florida near Pensacola. And then I decided I was going to do search and rescue, which at the time there weren't any females doing it. Mm -hmm. I think there had been a female before, but during the time I wanted to apply, there weren't any females. So when I went to my career counselor and told her what I wanted to do, she was like, oh, females aren't allowed to do this. Hmm. I was kind of like, well, why? Because it's it's not combat. It's, you know, it's search and rescue. So I don't really see. Was the rate actually closed off or they just were really not looking for female applicants? No, it was so for the C school. No, it wasn't closed off at all. They were we've always been undermanned. Um, huh. She just assumed that because there weren't any females in the community. Yeah. So I asked her, and this is always a a point for me to tell people when I'm mentoring them is don't take no for an answer because I was an E four. She was an E six. She was a career counselor. This is her job. So if I would have just said, oh okay, and then moved on, my entire life would be different now. And so I asked her, I kind of challenged her, and I said, well, can you just go back and look at the instruction and make sure it actually says no females can do it? Because it doesn't really make sense to me. (laughs) And so she did. She came back. She's like, well, I don't see where it says you can't, so I guess you can apply. (laughs) So did that. It's a good lesson. Just because somebody's sitting in a seat doesn't necessarily mean they're an expert. Well, I've learned that lesson throughout my entire career. Command career (laughs) counselors in the SEAL community, it's like a tertiary job. Yeah. You know, like it's their... Sometimes it's their primary job, but then they go back to being operational, so they're not really invested right. in the triple C job. Right. 
Exactly. <laughs> Which, like you said, can change the trajectory of your life or your career inside of the military. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like when you go to a recruiter, too. I mean, if you take yeah. everything they say at face value, you know, a you lot mean of mean you shouldn't? <laughs> I pretty openly talk about, I get the role of the recruiter. I know what they're doing. I mean, I look at when I enlisted, I was 17 through the delayed entry program. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I did the delayed entry program because all I did was fill that billet for the recruiter to check that box for that right. month because I waited until I was 18 and then I went. Like there was no benefit to do it. Right. And um, yeah, I actually had a female recruiter. She was awesome. She was a mechanic for the Blue Angels. Oh, nice. Um, and it was in 90, I started talking with her in 95. That's when I joined. Yeah, she didn't know much about the SEAL community. Nobody really did. Right. So not everything that she uh, told me about getting into it was accurate. Yeah. You know, the boot camp pipeline and, okay, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And then I got in and I'm like, okay, I'm on my own. I'm going to figure this out <laughs> yeah. on my own. Yes. So that's another point is if you are talking to a recruiter to make sure you do your research and ask around. I actually tell people if they can take somebody with you who spent some time in yes, the military. Absolutely. But anybody here locally, I have some people that I uh, that I train with, and they their kids are interested. And I'm like, listen, let me come with you. I'm not saying I'm going to say a word, but just let me sit there and absorb the information with you, and then we can talk about the options you may have or better options potentially right. on the on the table. Because at the end of the day, the recruiter's job is to recruit people. Right. And I also try to remind people there's the needs of the military. And you can get – the military will take the pound of flesh first is the way I describe it. But yes. you can get a pound and a half out as well. GI benefits. Exactly. Occupational training. I mean, it's amazing, but you have to know what you want and you have to know how to find those things. Right. Not necessarily the easiest thing to do when you're 17. Exactly. And that's why – and I always say, you know, <laughs> come talk to me or, yes. you know, I'll, I – and if it's a certain community I don't know about, then I'll put you in touch with somebody – I was just talking to someone who has, I want to say a master's degree and wanted to join the military as an officer, but went, ended up at a, just a regular recruiting station. And oh, that's were, not going to go well. Well, they did the whole thing and they, at least they had the sense to reach out and ask because the recruiter had said, or I actually said, I bet the recruiter said that you could go in enlisted and, and become an officer once you're there. And he's like, yeah. I was like, no. Yeah, four to don't six do years that. later. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's not like you enlist boot camp, put your officer package in. That's not right. how that's going to go. Right. But so many get fooled into that. So, yeah. yes, just know if you have a degree, you have other options to go direct commission. Yep. And I would not go the enlisted route unless that's something you wanted to do first then. you were enlisted the whole time right no i was enlisted for 10 years and then got commissioned what program me sep i got commissioned through the limited duty officer program okay do you have college do i have well, college degree they said yeah they so the me sep they send you to get your nursing degree so me sep is specific to you nursing. got suckered i have zero days of college but still got commissioned well i was a nurse you have to have a degree <laughs> you don't have to have a degree <laughs> I mean, I lot, I've watched a lot of ER. I know most of the stuff. No, it was it was fascinating to me. I was an E6. What rate, uh, rank were you when you got commissioned? So I was at HM2, so E5. Yeah. Um, when I joined or when I got accepted into the program. So I was at seven years and I was up for E6, but I Christmas treed the, the rating exam because I knew I was in college, not yep. taking that spot from somebody. So uh, yeah. MESEP. Mm -hmm. Did I say that correctly? What's that stand for? Medical Enlisted Commissioning Program. And it's specific. So if you get accepted to that program, you're going to be a nurse. Okay. That is specific for nursing. I think I know some male uh, SEAL corpsmen that went through this program. Probably. Yep. Did they commission you as a warrant or as a line officer? You're, you're a, um, we well, are a staff officer, but you, and okay. so you get a regular commission. I think I do know some people who have gone through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I've seen some SEALs or nurses that were SEALs. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was uh, the guy I was working with in second phase as an instructor, the head corpsman, I think was applying for that program. Then he ejected for like out of the community. I think it was for like 18 months, 24 months, something like that. And then. So it depends on your program. Um, it, they give you three years. And what's nice about MESEP is that you all of that time counts towards your retirement because you stay active yeah. duty. So they don't release you and you go do your school and then come back. So you go for three years. You come back, you know, so for me, I punched out at seven to start the program. And then when I came back, I was already at almost 10. And do they count that? So you're still coming in as an O one e with 10 though? Mm -hmm. 
So you did another four. So you probably got as what, 04, 05? I was 04 up for 05. That's Lieutenant Commander, people <laughs> listening. It sucks. You're actually the senior officer in the room. It's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so oh, I got you, as a lieutenant. Okay. Which is, you can call me man. Yeah. That's what I fuck with people too, especially the guys I used to work with who were enlisted. They're like, oh, nice uniform. I'm like, you can call me sir if it makes yeah. you feel better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, I I truly think that the fact I got picked up for LDO as an E6 with zero college yeah, and went to the exchange in September and talked to one of the ladies and was like, listen, um, I don't know what uniforms I need, but <laughs> I got approved for this program. Can you please help me get everything that I need to be an officer? So the, you don't have to go through an officer I did it months later. Oh. They sent me out to Rhode Island for yeah. like this four-week course yep. that had, I'm going to be totally honest, nothing to do with being an officer yes there was some well i mean i guess there were some uniform inspections <laughs> but it was tailored around i think more the fleet experience uh -huh. they did three or four days of legitimate mo boards like navigational chart plotting and the instructor yeah. was like hey i was there with another team guy he's like hey do you guys want to like maybe not show up for this because i don't think it has any bearing so we went and just worked out and yeah i think it's the same school i went to yeah up in rhode so, island yeah where i had a heart attack you had an actual heart attack I, well Paramedic induced, yeah. <laughs> we might as well, we're skipping all over the place, I and I love it. But we're going to go ahead and tell me about this heart attack. What happened? So it was, it was, you know, Sunday was the free day up there, so you could do whatever you wanted, lounge, whatever. And so my roommate said, "Hey, let's go run around the track and get some PT." And I was like, "Okay, whatever." So we do that. Come upstairs, and you know they have those huge brown fans that have probably been there for about a decade. You know, I'm talking about those big navy fans that are in the hallway. Probably. Time. So, because I went during the summer, so it was okay. just gross and hot. I went and during sticky. the winter. Yeah, so really hot. So I stuck my face in front of one of those fans, and immediately I felt my lips starting to swell and my tongue was starting to tingle, and I was like, oh, "That's weird." <laughs> so make it to the shower, and I'm I'm talking to my my roommate over the wall. I'm like, "Hey, my my mouth feels really funny," and she kind of threw out a joke. She's like, "Oh, who you been kissing?" <laughs> I was like, "No, for real. <laughs> like, there's something going like, on." I'm having so, a slight medical emergency here. <laughs> yeah. And she was already a surgeon. She was had already done her her civilian side, so she you know was an ENT surgeon. Mm -hmm. So we go back into our room, and she looks at me, and she's like, "Oh my God, your your face is really red." And I was like, "Yeah, like you know, it's." I don't really feel right. And so she hands me her mirror and it was a total hitch moment. You ever watch the movie Hitch? Yes. When he looks in the mirror. Cause like at first I was like, no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. And then she shows me the mirror. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> like, what the hell? And like my eyes were swelling. Once you see my lips yourself, were swelling. Yes. So I was like, yeah, yeah, that doesn't, I, I, that's not how I normally look. Something's wrong. So she drags me down to the quarter deck and my, everything was already swollen at that point. My ears even swell. It was, the oddest thing and so they, sounds like an allergic reaction oh yeah it was it was i was is anaphylaxis so they call the paramedic paramedic comes and i told him i said i know i look really scary right now i couldn't even see at that point because my eyes were swollen so shut i was like i know i look really scary but if you can just get me to you know the hospital which is right outside the the base there you know i'll be fine my airway's good yeah we're good i'm talking to you i have a good airway right and so I was starting to feel like some mucus buildup, but I was, you know, didn't want to panic. I was like, I'm good. So he puts me in the ambulance, starts an IV, normal. And then all of a sudden, shearing pain, my entire body. I was like, I, I, I'm going to die. Like all I could, I was thinking this in my head because I couldn't, my whole body contracted and I'm just, I'm kind of screaming because the pain is just my entire body. My roommate is on the bench in the ambulance and she's screaming at him like what the hell did you just give her and i'm trying to hit the defibrillator next to me and like get her attention because i was like i'm about to die you need to like yeah. pay attention because you're gonna need to use this on me <laughs> passed out at some point make it to the er and um turns out he gave me 2.5 milligrams of epinephrine iv push mm -hmm. so to put it in perspective um if you're dead we start with one milligram so he gave me one and a half times the dose of... Why would he do that? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, and if you have an allergic reaction, usually it's like an EpiPen, so it's IM, mm -hmm. and it's usually 0.5, so way, way overdosed. And heart, so knocked out my heart, not knocked out my heart, but he caused me to have a, a cardiac event, basically. And so my troponin levels were extremely elevated. 
um, my right kidney took a hit. So I was in the hospital for a week. You went for a wild ride. Yes. What caused that whole thing? Like what were the, what were you having a reaction to? They think it was mold on the fan. (laughs) That honestly is the most logical thing. Yes. Probably. Yes. So I was supposed to get tested and I I didn't afterwards, but yeah, they think it was because as soon as I stuck my face in front of it, I immediately felt. Oh, I bet something you it was happening. something coming off the blades. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those fans have been there. Like, God knows what's growing on those things. So Nobody does. Yeah. Nobody does. Yeah. And the military is not going to test because they don't want to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Those things have been, I mean, that building in Rhode Island, I think, is one of the oldest buildings that the Navy has. So It's a cool little base. It is. I think the War College is there. I believe so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We definitely were yes, at the same is. place then. Yep. Yeah. With the little chow hall right next to the yep. building. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yep, I went there just to E6 and came back in 01. Knew everything about being an officer. Yep, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, 01 was the worst rank. Was it? Oh, yeah. Like, I was treated better as an E1 than as an O1. Because O1, they still treat you like you're an idiot. But well, they, they don't... assume that you're right out of whatever. But they pro- Like, for me... I would wear my camis and my, you know, my butter bars, mm-hmm. and people would just think I was a brand new officer in the teams. Right. And I would just, I, I would kind of like feed into it. I'm like, they'd be like, "Oh, don't worry about it, sir. You'll understand <laughs> this later." I'm like, "Oh, thank you so much. Like, I can't wait. Like, thank you for the." And then they'd see me later in my khakis, and I'd see them. I'm like, "Yeah, that's right, motherfucker." <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I felt like they expected you to know stuff, but then they still, you know treated you like an idiot no one really was trying to help you in the so, medical profession yeah well nursing well, you know I, I love nurses but we do tend to not be so nice to i know exactly what you're talking people. about my sister is a nurse <laughs> practitioner okay she actually um just recently stopped working at camp Pendleton. she was a oh. uh, contracted nurse practitioner there oh nice okay yeah um yeah we we she was a what i would describe as a thorn in the side of the chain of command sometimes <laughs> Because of what you just said, she yeah. completely embodied that. Yes. Now she started off in, I don't want to say where, I don't know exactly where she started off, but she spent some time in the emergency room, emergency room mm-hmm. nurse at uh, Scripps La Jolla, I believe, and then transitioned over to the military system. Okay. And now she's working hospice, which I tell oh, you what, wow. is a job I could not do. So st- my first assignment as a nurse was at Balboa in the oncology ward, and we had two beds in the back that were for palliative care, and- that will take a toll on you. So I, yeah. you know, props to all the hospice nurses out there because, you know, with the cancer stuff, it's, you get to know them. Like you can't yeah. help but get to know these people and you get close to them and their families and everything else. And then when they pass away, it's it's like losing, you know, a good friend or a family member. And so. And if they hit that palliative ward, I mean, there's no, it's not like you're hoping for a miracle at that point, right? You're basically kind of managing. Yes. Until the end. Yeah. So if we, if we put you on palliative care, it's because. There's nothing else we can really do. So, my and, mom died of cancer, and my sister um, took care of her at the end of life, which I think yeah. I think was actually a really sharp double-edged sword for her. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm I guess I'm speaking for her a little bit because she got to spend so much time with my mom, but I don't think she got to really mourn as a daughter though right. either because she was in a professional mindset. Like it was really yep. tough. I was I was surprised to hear she wanted to go and pursue the hospice. Uh, or hospice care specifically and care for people at that phase of life. It's, I couldn't do it. No. I legitimately could not do it. I did 18 months. And when I got assigned to the cancer floor, I kind of thought like, you know, it would be older people who lived their life and, you know, kind of at the end of their life. And there, there were so many 19, 20 year olds. I mean, it was just. Really? Yes. What kind of cancer are 19 and 20 year olds get? <clears throat> um, a lot of leukemias, a lot of the osteo, um, the sarcomas. The, is that a genetic cancers. expression if you get it that early? Um, I don't think so. No. They just didn't I mean, win the lottery, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Environmental. I mean, like a lot of the leukemia is environmental. I mean, I, one of the foundations I support, Hunter 7, that's what they're doing a lot of research on with the burn pits overseas. And because we're getting so many people back with these rare cancers in their 30s yeah. that they shouldn't. And a cohort of 40 or 50 people from a unit of 100 yeah. is so mathematically outside the yes. odds of what it should be. And the military goes, nope, huh. not related. Yeah. But how long did they say that about Agent Orange too? Exactly. 30, 40, 50 years? Well, not exactly. 50 years. That's getting a little bit out, out of control. Call it 20 years? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, in, I was thinking about. I have a. I train jujitsu just down the road, and there is um, a woman there who's a mother and a wife. Her son, I think, is graduating from Marine Corps boot camp tomorrow. Okay. Which they don't get to go because thank you, COVID era. Yeah. Um, and her husband is um, dealing with those issues. And so many people from his unit are dealing with the same. And the military is basically doing everything they can to railroad accepting accountability. Right. Because if they do, therefore, they're on the hook for the treatment. Yes. It is so fucked. Yes. So incredibly bad. And I, look, I was thinking back because somebody had brought up burn pits not too long ago was asking me a question about them and I was exposed to them and, and by that I mean passing. I remember them being there because they're at every installation over there at some right. point, yep. even the little fobs. And I just remember the very bizarre smell yeah. that they had. It was so incredibly unique. It's not a, it's not a wood fire at your house. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they put everything in there. Everything. So. <laughs> we should combine human waste, batteries, uh-huh. and ammunition. Yes. And yeah, to say that that's not going to have some long-term effects. Yes. Uh, yes. I hope it doesn't take 20 years for the government to accept that they need to care for those people. Right. And so, and that's, again, the the foundation that I'm working with. They're trying to get somewhat ahead of it. I mean, it's always, it's already a problem, but, you know, to sort of get ahead of it for the rest of us who, because if you went over there, you know, everyone's at risk for it. So, you know, or being affected by it. And that's a long-term thing. So that's not just like, oh, I, you know, I was, I've been out of there for two years, so I'm good now. It's like, no, this can catch up to you at any point in your life. So. And there's and then there's probably mm-hmm. the the aspect that people don't forget about is a lot of those bases were pretty proximate to the civilian population over there. Yeah. And that stuff is just drifting out over yep. and and there's I mean, I doubt there's anybody tracking that stuff uh, for those populations. Right. And that's what Hunter Seven they're trying to do is do some research on the local populations yeah. in Iraq. Who had probably the most direct exposure because they live right. there. Exactly. Like, Full time. Right. So doing research on that population and then comparing and in, in seeing, you know, if there are any similarities. Yeah. So It's a travesty. Yeah. I see the impact that that stuff has and it's when rough. You, when you have guys that are dying, you know, from lung cancer in their 30s and they've never smoked before. Um, Ron Schur, who just passed away. Yeah. Lung cancer. I mean, <laughs> that yeah. happens a lot. So it's it's just odd, you know, shouldn't really happen. There really aren't a lot of things to explain that. Right. There's one. There's some common sense ones. <laughs> <laughs> but again, like we've already determined, I'm not a doctor. Yeah. Regardless of how much ER I've watched. Yes, I see that. <laughs> Actually, I was more a fan of House. I, that's the person I would I, like to I be. I know. You have I to wait until it's a complete shit show, and then you pull this abstract answer out of your head and solve the case every yes. time. Yeah. I'm it's, sure that's how it works. Yeah. He's like, it's got to be the worst case scenario. This is it. And, it's like, oh. and go against everything your team is saying right. to be proven right in the end every yes. time. Yes. <laughs> Tell them everyone to fuck off. It. So yeah. Can I, guys? Maybe. It's the internet. You can say whatever you okay. want to. <laughs> I leave it up to the guest to choose the vernacular that they want to go with. Yeah. So, um, so. we got to go back. I want to hear about, because we're talking about later on, because I definitely want to talk about <clears throat> your experience overseas. And I actually do want to talk about your experience in New York, too, at the uh, yes. front lines of the COVID. But Star School. How do you, how do you know about all this? <laughs> Instagram. So, you forget. You, I hit you up a long did, time ago. I was actually, well, I know, but how did you even hear about me? Um, I think it was through Mike Ritland. Oh, okay. To be honest. Okay. Yeah. I um, one thing I'd want to do is I I don't I can't I don't know if I can necessarily say I struggle. I know more guys than girls. Right. And I am always looking um, for women to have on the podcast to talk to. I think that you know for you um, or your. Background one, I mean, I'd love to hear your overall take of just a woman serving the military because it's different than guys. Right. Um, and I don't have a lot of people that I can reach out. Then with, you know, the treatment you were doing in the helicopter stuff, I mean, come on. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. Experience with COVID, what you're up to now. I'm like, how could you not at least reach out and be like, come on, come on the podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. I know. I saw it and I was like, what? Does he not know I'm a nobody? <laughs> I am too. That's we're we can equally be nobodies. No, you're you're more of a somebody than I am. <laughs> no, no, I, I would not say that. So, SAR school. SAR school. Yeah. So so yes. Yeah, so I. You determined it actually is an option for you. Yes. So <laughs> I apply. So my personality is to get something in my head. I'm like, oh, I got to do this, and not really think it through. And I was never the, the fittest or the fastest or, or anything like that. I wasn't this big, you know, PT guru in the gym all the time. Like, that wasn't my thing. Yep. 
didn't really think about all that. And so applied to it, got accepted. I'm like, yeah, awesome. So <laughs> get to uh, the first school, air crew school. And, you know, most would say, oh, that was, that was nothing <laughs> for me, for somebody who really didn't do a whole lot with like running or anything. Yeah. If you don't um, go into that with a pretty good idea of what you're getting into, it's going to be something. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. And, you know, that was my first little taste. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I better get my ass in shape. Because um, at the time I was like a buck 15 of that. So then I get my first command, which is China Lake, California. So out in the middle of nowhere. Is that a testing facility? It is, yeah, yeah. Weapons test squadrons out there. A lot of EOD does do, they do their. They sent you up there as a stuff. SAR person? Yeah, because so there's a station SAR there. So for all of the, uh, the people on base so we really? have there are two squadrons so if anything ever happened with gotcha. the pilots um and then we did sorry for the surrounding area as well for okay. civilians with the hikers and all that stuff um when i first you know researched the the search and rescue corpsman thing what i was told was that the crewman goes down you stay in the helicopter they bring the patient up and then you do your thing transport like, oh, okay, to a cool. higher level of care yes yep because I'm terrified of heights. Like, terrified. Like, if I sit on this table, I'd be like, ugh. Oh. <laughs> so, of course, you applied for a job that involves flying around in a helicopter. Right. Well, how's it, well, it's a helicopter. I mean, you're, you know, which I, I hated flying, too, so I don't. Really? But I loved flying, but I hate, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I I'm get a, it. Yeah. I'm a walking contradiction. I wanted to be a jet pilot, but I like to be in control. So, I don't like the commercial flying where you're, you know, just sitting yeah. there like a, depending on something there's you a difference know. when you have your hands on the controls versus you're sitting back and you have no control right exactly so anyway get to my first duty station and it's over land and so i when i get there the guy says hey we're sending you to repel school at pendleton and i was like oh no 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 we don't we don't go down like the crewmen go down and he's like oh no over land the the corpsmen go down and i was like well i wasn't told <laughs> like, i'm not doing repel school <laughs> And like, okay, well, then you're not going to do this job. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to repel school. So when does repel school start? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I go down there and the first repel is off a tower. And I must have shaken that entire, I mean, my legs were just going. And the guy down below who was belaying was like, just freaking go. And I'm like, I don't want to go. Eventually do it. Have fun. It's kind of the theme of my life. It's like, yep. no, no, no. And then, oh, that was great. So... Then I was repelling out of helicopters um, for that training. And, and then it became, I loved it. I mm -hmm. love repelling. So got over that fear, um, but then realized as well that I need to be pretty physically fit to do this job because you have to haul people and, you know, it's mostly men and average weight, 180 to 200. And you have to be able to lift them into the litters and the stretchers yep. and everything else. And, you know, hoist up with them you have to repel down with all your gear so we used to repel with the stoke stretcher which is about 70 pounds and then your pack was another 50 pounds and it's a lot know. of stuff oh yeah all together almost weighed as much as i did so would they send you <laughs> down solo or would they send an air crew down with you so you you're designed to go down solo um if a crewman was able to and you had enough then they they would go down as well but the minimum crew was a one pilot the crew chief and you so if that was your minimum crew that you got called out on, so yeah, eight after hours, and it's it's all you. Um, if there was an extra crewman that could get on board, then that the extra crewman would usually go down with you. And, and were they flying Blackhawks? We were flying Hueys at the time, up there. That's actually a really capable platform. I, I like Hueys. I love Hueys. They would fly it single pilot, huh? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I was really sad that the the Navy got rid of those. <laughs> well, there is a little bit better tech out there. I mean, the Blackhawks are more capable i would say yeah i guess yeah i don't know the hueys are nice well the marine corps has hueys still they just have the, the super hueys or whatever they call them now yeah that don't sound like hueys because they're four blades marine corps still they still do training with fixing bayonets you know it's, it's 2021 i'm not saying anything. i love the marine corps but you know they can have their hueys and their fixed bayonets <laughs> fuck fixed bayonets no i don't want to be involved in something that requires that <laughs> true true but they also have Ospreys, too, which... I'm not a fan of the V-22. I am not a fan. Not a fan at all. And I grew up in the era where they crashed all the time. That was the era that I, I was in as well. They were doing test jumping. And it, actually, the V-22 killed quite a few Marines. Yeah. On, uh, for whatever... I think they were getting the qualification to do um, insertions. And I remember hearing more than one report of them just augering in. And I don't know what, what phase of flight. Because for people listening to V-22, it's... Uh, 
it can look like an airplane or it can look like a helicopter and actually just about everything in between. So I think they can take off vertically. I don't know when they yes. crash, but it killed quite a few people. If it was a vertical takeoff transitioning to forward flight, but it wasn't awesome. I just I just always remembered, you know, Osprey suck and they crash all the time. And, you know, that was back in the 90s. And so yeah. just kind of never thought about them again. And when I was in Afghanistan, we had to go from Leatherneck and we pushed out to a combat outpost. And they're like, all right, your ride's here. And I looked at that thing. I was like, uh, oh, no. They <laughs> no. look weird. They're, yeah, they're yeah. just, you know, did not want to get on that thing. But again, you're kind of in a position where you don't really say no. So, yeah, at that point, either you're going to get on your ride or you're not going to go. Right. I avoided them like the plague. I tried to, but yeah, that was that was a pretty common aircraft they were using to For the shuttle Marines, people. Yeah. Or 53s, yeah. probably. 53s and, yeah, B-22s and C-130s yeah. were the common aircraft to shuttle between the FOBs and the COPs and whatever else. So That makes sense. So, yeah, you don't really have a choice. You just line up and get on and cross your fingers that, you know, doesn't it crash? (laughs) (laughs) That the flying vehicle maintains its ability to fly? Yes. Yeah. Which it's, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the military, right? Like, how many times were you in a position where, like, I don't want to, if I were in any normal circumstance, I would not be doing this. And More than I can count. Right. Yeah. You just have to go with it. More than I can count. So, China Lake, how did, uh, where'd you go after that? So, after China Lake... I wanted to stay in the Southern California area, so the only thing that was available was a rescue swimmer school billet. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was an E4, and it was an instructor billet, so I applied to it, and they're like, no, you have to be an E5. And I was like, well, it's kind of only where the only place I want to go. And it was a hot fill. For some reason, nobody was taking it, which I thought was odd. I was like, San Diego, and it's an instructor billet? (laughs) Why wouldn't people want this? Kind of thought I was missing something, because I was like, well... Maybe it's bad, but, you know, again, I wanted the location, so yep. I kept applying for it every month, and then finally, because they weren't getting any other applicants, the the uh, the head education guy calls me and he says, all right, I'm going to interview you because you're the only <laughs> candidate right now, so. You continue to be the only application that we get. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, so another lesson, persistence. <laughs> That's a legit lesson with the military, too. Yes. If you get told no. Keep going at it and be as persistent as possible. Yeah, you know, be a thorn in their ass, and they'll they'll eventually, you know, tell you to go away, or you or know, you might get what you want. Exactly. So, yeah. and I've always gotten what I want when you know just being persistent and not taking no for an answer. So, yeah, I ended up getting that billet and went down, and um, I went through rescue swimmer school. So, as a corpsman, this is where most people don't understand. If you're a search and rescue corpsman, you're not required to go through rescue swimmer school. Okay. That is an option if you are, you know, an instructor at the school or, or whatever. So I went through the school and only girl in a class of 28 and had my ass in to me. So <laughs> again, I was like, oh, this is a great idea. And then, yeah, <laughs> like, what am I doing? Where do so, they conduct that school? Is that North Island? So that one is done at 32nd Street. Okay. Just across the bay. Yeah. So that's a surface rescue. So it's the same curriculum as the one in Pensacola for the air crew guys. Um, okay. The difference is they use rib boats and instead of helicopters for for that evolution. So, um, but yeah, but everything else is the same. And you know, didn't I've never swam with fins before, and we use those gigantic rocket sw- <laughs> fins. Which was like my legs are gonna fall off. So. Um, you know, underwater swims, all that stuff. And yep. it's just, yeah, d- again, did not research that. and was like, so this will be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yep. My, okay. So then you became an instructor. I was an instructor. So did that for about four years and just started thinking about, you know, search and rescue corpsman really doesn't translate on the outside because search and rescue is usually police departments or fire departments. So as not a primary job either. No, no. So yeah, you have to go through all of the training as a regular police officer or firefighter. And then that's, you know, something that if you want to fly on helicopters, that's, you know, another level that you have to apply to. So I was just kind of like, yeah, I don't really want to start over with any of that. So what am I going to do? And then I started looking into the commissioning programs. And so ended up getting accepted to the MESET program and then went back to Vegas for nursing school and came back to San Diego for my first assignment at Balboa. Did they make you do anything while you were at school 
like attached with the military or were you pretty much free and clear and just focusing on the medical school? So you are supposed to check in. So if you're near a Navy installation, um, I think those guys have to do a little bit more. I was next to a Navy reserve station that, you know, I showed up and they're like, who are you? <laughs> like, perfect. Oh, I'm one of the students. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, look, I just need to do my PRGs and I got to yep. do my advancement exams twice a year. And, and then the, the evals. Okay. Like, okay. <laughs> so you were still connected to the military, but the, most of your effort, if not the vast majority of it, was on just getting through the program. Right. Okay. Right. That makes yeah, sense. The reserve station was like, oh, whatever, you know, yeah. I guess if you need anything, we're here. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. So I actually, you know, I was active duty, but you feel like a civilian. So yeah. I bleached my hair. Yeah, I was going to say, you're probably not wearing, kinds of you're not wearing uniforms oh, and stuff. Oh, no. No. Yeah. Did not wear a uniform for two and a half years. So it was Sounds great. like the best part of the program. Yeah. And then I had control. So I actually did, I had to do a few more prerequisites for that program. So I had, I took, I think it was two semesters to finish up my prereqs. So Mm -hmm. it was a spring and a summer semester. And because I only needed a couple of classes, the other class, you have to go full time. So the other classes I filled with like rock climbing and I think martial arts (laughs) and ballet. I mean, it was just crazy stuff. And then I stacked all my classes Monday through Wednesday and I had the rest of the time off. I like where your head's at. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, got to game the system a little bit. Yeah. That's actually, (laughs) that's a pretty cool break to have at that point. Cause you said you went there at like the seven year mark, right? Seven. Yeah. So you're probably a little bit like, ugh. Yep. Military sucks. Take a couple <laughs> years. Yes. Recalibrate, come back. Yes. It's not a bad idea. Maybe they yeah. should let people furlough for a touch. There, there Maybe have like been, a year. There have been some programs for that to where I don't remember what they call it, but you can basically kind of leave for a year and then and come back. Recalibrate, reset, yeah. come yep. back and deal with what I'm going to call the bullshit. Exactly. <laughs> and so there's a there was enlisted commissioning program as well, ECP. Okay. I don't know if you remember that. Um, but same type of deal, but it was open to any community so it wasn't specific to nursing Hmm. um that was around for a while too i don't know if it's still around but again same idea i mean you know i tell everyone like use the milk they're gonna use you they're gonna get everything out of you so you know so i got these programs then they'll get their pound of flesh yeah but there's programs like that where you're talking full i mean i'm assuming you didn't pay out of pocket for any of those classes so the thing with mesep is that so the difference between mesep and like stay 21 or Or ocs or yeah i don't know what else what other like educational programs um yeah it's not officer candidate school i forget what jocko went through but he might have gone through ocs but they you basically same thing, detach, full time school and then come back with a commission. Right. Yeah. So stay twenty one um does and like ROTC and all those mm-hmm. is that they pay for your education. The difference with MESEP is you stay on active duty. So you're getting your pay. You're getting your BA is full pay. Mm-hmm. But you do have to find you have to figure out your tuition. Really? Yes. Interesting. And you can Can use, you use your tuition assistance and you, stuff like that? You can't use tuition assistance, but you can use your GI bill. Okay. Which is what I did. Um but What's kind of crappy about that is you lose. So the GI Bill, when you're active duty, it only pays for tuition. So you lose that whole monthly stipend. Stipend, but you're getting paid. So it's kind of you know it's one of those things. Well, I'm going through college, I'm getting paid, so yeah. all I really need is tuition money. So that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, at least you get to use it for what it's designed. I know yeah. a lot of people, for myself included, I have full GI benefits and I've yet to actually execute yeah anything on it because I don't know what I would use it for to be honest. Well. Oh, you can't pass it down either, can you? I don't think so. Yeah. I think I'm going to become a blacksmith, though, and just make custom-made knives. Because yeah. I've been watching Forged in Fire on the History Channel. Yeah. Pretty much be going to specialize in Damascus is what I've determined. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. Okay. That's my personal plan. And I don't yeah. think I can use the GI Bill for that. You might. There might be programs. If anybody listening <laughs> knows about a school that wants to teach me how to make knives <laughs> with the GI Bill, hit me up. <laughs> so, Officer Path, you come back, the freshly minted butter bar. <sighs> God. So here's the thing is that I was always pre-hospital and then I was usually the only female in my unit. So that's what I'm used to. Yeah. I come back as a nurse and now I'm in a hospital and I'm surrounded by women, (laughs) which no offense to women, but it's, it's a different culture. It's a different way of thinking. And yeah, it was... (laughs) There's a reason there's books that are titled <laughs> Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. Yes, yes. <laughs> so the first couple of years was a little rough. Um, there have been many, at that point, 
I was at 12 years, I think. And I had to, I had to go, I had to gave him, or I had to give him four years for mm-hmm. the program. So automatically you're in it for four years. And I was like, you know, at that point I was at 14 and a half years once I was done with my obligation. And I was like, fuck this. I'm done with this shit. I'm not dealing with this for another six years. I don't even care anymore. Like this is just, yeah, not what I expected. And, you know, I was on the oncology floor. Like I thought I'd be in the emergency room and, you know, continuing on with emergency medicine and be like, oh no, every nurse goes to a med surge floor. First? Yes. Okay. Would they let you pursue that after? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's something that you have to put in for and ask for, Um, but you don't always get it. So a lot of people ended up in OB. (laughs) And you had men in OB that didn't want to be in OB. So I mean, that's basically you know, delivering babies, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, needs of the Navy. So yeah. Um. Yes. So it was just you know you were hoping that you would get the ER. For me, it was ER or ICU is where I wanted to end up. So uh, that took about two two and a half years to get to that location. So it was it was brutal. It was a brutal couple of years because when you're you're working shifts. And the way they do it in the military is you work six weeks of nights and then six weeks of days and you just flip flop that. And then your days are, you know, you work Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then off Monday, Tuesday, on Wednesday, Thursday, off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it just keeps revolving like that. And then that sounds horrendous. It's it's pretty brutal. <laughs> so you would do three days straight of being on at the tail end mm-hmm. of that. How mentally checked out are you at like the second day and let alone the third day you're exhausted yeah how is that exhausted. safe why do they why do they think that that's a good plan well i mean that's you know the medical profession kind of in general i mean you know you for a while you had residents working i mean i'm sure you still do but i i think they've been trying to regulate more of the residents hours because they were yeah. working i don't know 36 hours straight 48 hours that's not i mean i've been up for 36 hours 48 yeah. hours not Could i mean you imagine like cutting someone open after that <laughs> Yeah, but I would be like, oops, wrong leg, my bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, so. I don't want the doc that's been up for 36 or 48. I yeah. would almost be like, hey, can you wheel me out of here and I'll come back in a day when the new shift is on? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have a lot of tired people in hospitals. So, um, hmm. no, it's, it's brutal. And I, after that third day, you know, you have two days off, but you're pretty much sleeping the next two days yeah. because you're just Trying mentally and physically exhausted. So. Yeah, there's when I was in the ER, there were many times, I think I just posted about it, but there were times where I didn't even pee for 12 hours. And that's that's I'm, not healthy, I don't think. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> UTIs. Yeah, um, that's but you're not just good. you're going and going and that you just don't even realize, you know, like, oh, I haven't eaten, I haven't really drank anything, but coffee, and then I haven't really peed. So Wow. Yeah, I did many shifts like that. So So how did you uh, end up overseas? So I ended up, so after Balboa, I transferred to the Naval Hospital on Camp Pendleton. And that's the one I, that's like 15 miles deep into Camp Pendleton? It, it was. Yeah. So they the actually, middle of nowhere? Yeah. But they moved it <laughs> forward. So now it's My over. My sister works at the new one. Yes. And she actually worked at the old one, I think, for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. No, I know exact hospital. I actually, when I was going through the medical retirement process, I went there and I had to have a test done on my leg where they shoved in a bunch of needles. They were... Um, it's like a nerve conduction study, I think. Hmm. They okay. were checking, because uh, basically I have uh, a lot of uh, nerve damage on the left-hand side of my leg. Okay. And so, yeah, the guy was in there, especially like acupuncture with, and he just keep tapping him in. Yeah. I'm like, that's okay. touching the bone. You can stop, yeah. sir. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then he would hook up stuff and yeah. show right leg versus left. And he was like, okay. And it just went into part of my uh, PEB package. Yep. But yep. I know that hospital. Oh, yeah. I remember driving to it. I'm like, why is this hospital here? Why is this hospital the farthest place from yeah. anywhere? Yeah, I don't really know why. Because it probably was know. the middle of like the Camp Pendleton Range Complex and all that stuff. It probably was based off of that, but it was nowhere near the front gate. No, not at all. It was pretty difficult to get to. Yeah, so they moved it to right next to the front gate. Yeah, um, an awesome building. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Overlooks the ocean. I mean, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So, um, but no, I was in the old hospital when I was there. And that was my... So I got... I was put into the ICU finally, and right away, um, Haiti happened. So it was January of 2010, mm-hmm. and I'd only been there a couple months. I hadn't even been trained as a critical care nurse yet because it took it's a few months of training. And because 
Camp Pendleton doesn't get a lot of critical patients because they end up transferring them out to Balboa or other surrounding makes sense. larger hospitals. So really didn't have much training as far as critical care goes. Earthquake happens and my command calls me. So this was, so the earthquake happened on a Tuesday, January 12th, I believe it was. And I worked Wednesday night and I was supposed to work Thursday night and I wake up after sleeping during the day to my phone just blown up by my division officer and department head. And I was like, oh shit, did I kill my patient? <laughs> like what's going on? And so I call and, and my Tivo was like, hey, you've been watching the news, right? And I'm like, yeah. And she was like, yeah, we're sending people. And I said, oh, okay. And she was like, we're going to send you. And I'm like, okay, when? And she said, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> This is just like the classic military tale. People will be listening to this and be like, what do you mean? They didn't ask you and they I, also yeah. gave you 12 hours? I'm yeah. like, I mean, welcome I, to the show. I really was like, first of all, I don't think that's, I don't think the Navy can even work that fast. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm a nurse. It's not like, you know, I'm ready to go and we're expecting a phone call to, to whatever. Yeah, you're you not know? on a pager for a rapid deployment. Exactly. So <laughs> I was like, I kind of laughed and I'm like, what? <laughs> Like, be in Haiti tomorrow. She said, yeah, that's the plan. So don't come into work tonight. Come in tomorrow. <laughs> I said, to go to Haiti. And I said, for how long exactly? And she's like, well, just plan on six months because we're not really sure. I said, so you want me to leave tomorrow <laughs> for possibly six? Okay. So roll Everything into work. Everything so far sounds normal to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I roll into work and we have this huge meeting and all the people who were tagged. And so we didn't end up going that day, but we did end up going either Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. So it takes them a while I, to get the logistical wheels in motion. Right. So I think, so 48 hour notice. Yeah. So we get on the plane, we go to Gitmo and the logistics have not been set. <laughs> so we get to Gitmo. Of course they haven't. And they're like, you know, we're waiting to get on a plane to, to go down to Haiti. They're like, oh, we're going to actually hold you here for a little bit because the ship that we were going to, it wasn't the Comfort, we were going to the Bataan. They don't even know you're coming. <laughs> And they have no room for you. Awesome. So we were a surgical team that was augmenting their their small medical team that was on the ship. Okay. And there were about I want to say sixty of us, I think. And so the CEO was like, uh, I don't have any. I don't have room. For That's a lot of room to plus up on a naval vessel. It's right. Not like they just have right. empty birthing space all over the place. Exactly. And the majority were officers. So technically, if you wanted to, you know. They needed to, to polish the, the ivory whatever, handle so. coffee cups and the, <laughs> yeah, they needed to get your enlisted <laughs> servants prepared in, in their tuxedos. <laughs> I know how it works on a ship. I'm joking. I have no idea how it works on a ship at all. Well, yeah, I didn't either. So um, I was like, you know, just expecting the, the three high racks or whatever, which is actually what we ended up in. But yeah. um, we ended up in the airport at Gitmo for 36 hours because they were trying to figure out the logistics of where we were going to go and where they're going to put us. So finally they end up, okay, planes here, get on the plane, which happened to be four CODs. Have you ever flown in a COD? I have. Oh. I've been to carrier landing and takeoff on a COD. Oh my God, those things are terrifying. They are. And you can't see a goddamn thing. No. And yeah. see, again, I, I like to be able to have a little <laughs> bit of control. So the fact that I have no control yeah. flying and then I can't see on top of it and then you're facing backwards. I'm like, this is not comfortable. <laughs> Don't yeah. But again, like shut up and, you know, do what you're told. <laughs> okay. So four of it or four CODs. So we all split into these teams to get, you know, divide evenly in the four CODs. Take off, fly. You don't, when we hit the, uh, to land, mm -hmm. I, I thought we were crashing because you, you don't oh, so even you like- Oh, so you a carrier landing? Basically in Haiti because- Oh, you landed we, on an airstrip. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we, yeah, we landed on an airstrip, but the way we landed, one, you know, it was like he was landing on a carrier. And then yeah. two, I didn't even know it was coming because I couldn't freaking see and nobody's <laughs> telling you that. They oh, didn't hey, even give descending. you that cursory like heads up, like <laughs> no, we're- No, it just that's like shitty. slams into the freaking runway and you're like, holy shit, are we still alive? Um, they get good shocks on those things. Yeah. They smash those things into carriers. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> Crazy. So get to Haiti and it's, I mean, it's just, that was kind of, and I hate like saying this in the public room, but like it was my first, like we are completely disorganized. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, this is a humanitarian effort. I can't imagine if we're getting shot at on top of this. So we get to the, we get to the beach 
and or we go through this building and everybody checks in and then we get out to the beach where there are a bunch of helicopters lined up because there are a bunch of ships out there so you had the comfort you had the carl vinson the and are Baton. they just cycling people out for care essentially so for medical care the so, patients or yeah so at, so for us we were we were trying to get to whatever ship we were assigned to mm -hmm. And they have all the, the helicopters. With the, the helicopters were going, they're going and grabbing patients and then bringing them to whatever ship. Um, but That's for what us, I meant. They were taking people to get treated on the vessels, based yes. floating uh, yes. medical treatment. Yes. Okay. So, but for us, when we got there, and so I started looking around. I had some friends on another plane and they weren't there. And our group was, you know, the chief was like, hey, you know, get in line and get on a helicopter type. I'm like, okay. I'm a, I'm a little JG at this point. I'm like, this is, this is all not okay. Like we're completely disorganized. There was like this huge line, like you're getting on a roller coaster and then you got to the front of the line and they would just like go on that helicopter, go on that helicopter. And I'm like, how do you even know it's going to where you need to go? You so don't. you don't, right? There's like five <laughs> ships out here. So I'm like, what are we doing? And so, and the crew chief's like, get on a helicopter. I'm like, I go to my chief. I'm like, pull everybody back first of all we're missing people <laughs> we're yeah. missing a whole plane right now and he's like no we're not everybody's everybody's here and i'm like i'm telling you we are missing people because they're my friends and they're not here so can we like figure this out first before we start spraying people on hel random helicopters going to random, random ships? ships which you know at that point you're kind of stuck so you know it's not like you oh i'm on the wrong ship you know hitch me a ride over to the other ship yeah you, so, that's called the bottom of the priority list exactly so I'm like, why am I the one thinking of this? I'm just a stupid JG. Like, this is stupid. So anyway, we pull everybody back. And I'm like, I'm telling you, we're missing a whole plane. <laughs> so he runs back up to the building. And he comes back. He's like, no, 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 we have everybody. I'm like, we are missing this person, this person, this person, this person, whatever. So fight, like, we're off to the side. Because I'm like, we need to figure this out. And then finally, like, all the other people start coming out. And I was like... I started thinking about the fact that we thought we had everybody. That plane could have been like in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Yep. I'm sorry. No, no, no. They, they actually never did show up. Not there. Let me rewind. They didn't show up. I'm thinking, who knows what happened to this plane? Again, they're like, we need to, we need to get out to our ship. I see my two officer in charge who are both, it's a commander and a captain. They're about to get on a helicopter. I go running over to them. I said, sir, I do you know where this helicopter is going? Like I, cause I was trying to ask the crew chief. He was just screaming at me and it's, yeah. cause I get you know, on. Yeah. Just get on a helicopter. I don't know where it's going. Well, it'll get you where you need to go. I'm like, yeah. I used to be a crewman. <laughs> <laughs> I know that line. <laughs> like you're just trying to get rid of people. So run over to him and they're like, no, no, it's fine. They told us that we're going to, they're going to take us to where we need to go. I'm like, all right, sir. So go back to the group. And I tell the chief, I'm like, we need to make sure that we're going to the baton. That's who, that's, you know, my whole thing was, is if we end up on the comfort, which most people who are not medical see you as medical are going to take you to the comfort because that's the hospital ship. Yeah. That wasn't our assignment. I said, if you end up on the comfort, you're going to get stuck there yeah, because they're going to see that. medical people and like, oh, come on board. <laughs> you're I mean, it's not a floating going anywhere. hospital, essentially. Yeah. And they needed people. So they see a bunch of doctors and nurses and corpsmen show up. They're going to they're going to keep you. So and the problem with the hospital ships is you can't land a bigger helicopter um, than a 60 on there. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't they're I heard they're changing that. But yeah, you can't you can't land a 53. Or 46. Or, yeah. yeah, 46 or a V-22. So you're stuck. If you get stuck there, you're stuck there until, you know, if yeah. they let you go, till you can get a helicopter that's small enough to, to land on there. So anyway, what ended up happening, our two OICs ended up on the Comfort. Awesome. <laughs> like I said, it was going to happen. We end up on our ship. Um, the other, the missing crew came in, I think it was like 12 hours later. Oh, wow. They broke down in, in Gitmo. But again, I was like, they could have crashed in the middle of the ocean and nobody would have been the wiser until. Headcounts are kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm like, I'm a freaking JJ. <laughs> like, why am I bringing this up? This should be, you know. So yeah. So and again, it got me thinking like, wow, we really like had a big conflict. <laughs> we need all these assets. I don't know. It's a mess until <laughs> infrastructure is established. Yeah. You yeah. are running hard and fast, and a lot of the times you're outpacing your support. Right. I mean, that's basically what it looks like. Right. You're sitting there calling audibles on the fly, doing the absolute best you can. Yes. And it's not pretty. No. And so 
Yeah, so I get to the baton. I haven't slept in 36 hours because we were on the airport floor and you know, yeah. didn't sleep. And get up there and I'm thinking like, okay, maybe they'll point me in the direction of Iraq and I can you know, get a little bit of sleep. And they're like, get over to the ICU. Like there's incoming 36 people. <laughs> like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. So go to the ICU. And the ICU on the baton is, is fairly large. And so it's like 15 beds. And so I, I get up there and it's just, it's chaos. Yeah. I mean, there's patients in every bed and, you know, they're like, just grab a bed. And I'm like, and do what? Like, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Just grab a I bed. It's gra- awesome. Grab a patient, grab a bed. I'm like, I don't know where the patient or the, the supplies are. Like, I've never been on a ship before. I don't know. An orientation perhaps would yeah. be in order. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's kind of the, the theme of how that whole experience went. Um, and we you would, guys, so you basically did that floating medical flotilla i should have said medical flotilla which (laughs) implies floating and so they would just cycle in patients and you guys would treat and then where would they go once you i mean the discharge on that's going to involve a helicopter ride yes i'm assuming yes so they either went back to haiti Mm -hmm. um if they needed more care there were some ngos that were out there taking care of people on the on land or if they needed more extensive care we would ship them over to the comfort Okay. Which they were super ecstatic about that. Because <laughs> like, we, we were kind of there for that damage control, like fix them up, couldn't keep them very long, be like, okay, take them to the comfort. And they were like, really? <laughs> they had just gotten off a deployment themselves, I believe. Oh, um, really? They had just gotten back or something like that. Yeah. And then we're told that they went to Virginia and then we're told to, to head down to Haiti. So that crew was already kind of over it. And yeah. they ended up getting stuck there for a long time because they got stuck with all the patients that needed more of that long-term care. So How long were you there for? I was there for almost three months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I come back and resume my critical care training, which I've already had like 15 IC patients at any given time Yeah, trying to figure Sounds out. Sounds like you had some and, OJT. Oh, yeah. I was training. literally like in books and, you know, trying to get on the slow computer for like, oh, how do I manage event? Because I've never done that before. Um, wow. Yeah. And I was working nights too. So it was kind of, you know, by myself and trying yeah. to figure it out. So um, come back and then I'm like, oh, now I can actually resume my, my training <laughs> for critical care. And I get sent down to Balboa because that's where we did most of our training since they have a higher acuity. And I think it was like three weeks into it, I get a call from my divo and she's like, hey, we're going to pull you back. And I was like, okay. Because I was supposed to be there for six weeks. She's like, we have another tasker. <laughs> Mind you, when she said the Haiti thing, she was like, hey, if you like, because at that time, this was 2010, Mm -hmm. critical care nurses were getting deployed quite often. Yeah. So she was like, if you do this Haiti thing, no matter how long, this will count as your deployment. You're good for a bit. Yeah, you're good for a year, (laughs) right? So I was like, all right, whatever. So anyway, at Balboa, she was like, she's like, we got a task her. And I was like, "Uh, okay, when? And she was like, well, it's, it's in a month. And I said, but ha- Haiti, <laughs> yeah. she was like, yeah, but that was kind of T80 since it was less than 90 days. And I was like, uh, that's not what you said or what we agreed on. And so I'm like, am I the only fucking nurse in the Navy that can deploy right now? Like what yes. the hell's going on? Only you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, and then I have like all these guys who probably would have given their arm or leg to deploy. They're sitting at Balboa. Because taskers, you know, are specific. They, they come down to certain installations, right? Yep. And and the installations don't like to turn them away. They don't like to say, oh, no, we can't do it. So they take them. Even when, you know, you got personnel over at this other place. We're kind of, you know, short over here, but they, they still take them. So people are seeing me just going, going like, what the hell? Like, why are you the one going? I'm like, I trust me. I'm not asking for this. Yeah, so. I'm, not, I'm not sitting here with my <laughs> hand raised the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So... She was like, we need you to go to Afghanistan. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, six months. She's like, well, no, this is 10 months. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so I go. 10 well, months with a one month notice. This is a definite military tale. Yes, so, and then our <laughs> training was 30 days in Okinawa. Really? Yeah, which, so we were supposed to go with third, um, third med battalion, which okay. is in Okinawa. So they're like, we're sending you guys. So they pulled all these people to, again, be a, a damage control surgical team. And they sent us to Okinawa to basically augment their companies at the med battalion there. Okay. And 
So we, they're like, you're going to do 30 days of training there, and then you're going to deploy from there with that company. Okay, so we go to Okinawa. While we're there, third gets cut from the, <laughs> the tasking. And they're like, it's going to go back to first. First is in California. So they're like, you'll finish your training out here, but then we're going to send you back to first. <laughs> so you can do your in-processing with first, and then you'll go on to Afghanistan. And it was like... So we're in just Japan. rack and frequent flyer miles. <laughs> it's like so Japan to California for a couple it's a of short days, flight. It's and a short then flight. all the way around to Afghanistan via the East Coast. So I was like, I literally went around the world in like four days yeah. <laughs> during that. So yes, so that's how I ended up in Afghanistan. Where did they put you? So we started out at Leatherneck, okay. and then we pushed out. So my team was we were kind of like this. We were a surgical team, and we were augmenting teams that were out there for resuscitation. So those are called shock trauma platoons. So it's kind of your ER. Um, we were like the OR of the teams. Okay. But a lot of times those those shock trauma platoons would be out by themselves. If they knew there was going to be, you know, something going on, they would push the surgical team over to them, you know, to be ready for that. So, yeah. um, so that's kind of – we were sort of traveling around that, or we were there in Hellman for that purpose. And so the first place was pain. Um, it was a combat outpost uh, near Pakistan. LAR was out there, light um, armored reconnaissance. Yep. These guys, only men were out there. <laughs> they had not seen a female in probably, I don't know, four months, I think, at that point. Um, there were a couple of nurses that were with it, the team that was out there. But then, like, we show up, and it's me and another nurse and some other ones, and I where they could sniff us out i mean it was that was my first like oh this is what a celebrity feels like because they were following us and then like they would know when we we're going to, to chow and oh, be God. waiting for us afterwards and then i had e3s that were finding me on the global and emailing me. seriously yeah. i was a lieutenant at this point so i was like whoa ballsy yeah <laughs> oh yeah um it was... have you ever heard of fraternization and it yeah. is still frowned upon <laughs> it was just i just think they like you know yeah. they hadn't seen a female it was like whatever that's 100 like, what it was yeah 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 so that was interesting um it got to the point where our oic was like you know we don't really want you guys walking around without yeah <laughs> an escort which, smart yeah, and that's, you know, it's fine. I totally got it. But, yeah, so we were at Payne for a while, and then um, went What kind of to... stuff would uh, would you deal with when you were out there at those cops? So we would, we had, our first patient was a amputee. Um, Probably I IED. He was, yeah, I think it was an IED. Um, it was an A&A, &A, and I was there, Afghan so. Afghan National Army. <laughs> I always get, I people get lost in the acronyms. I do the best that yes, I can. I'm sorry. I can't that's okay. I forget. Um so our team was a ground surgical team. So we weren't supposed to be flying. Dustoff was doing a lot of the intra-theater transports for stuff like that. At the time, the Dustoff medics didn't have the critical care skill set, which they they now have rectified that. And yeah. now, they're, now the paramedics are getting the critical care part of it. Whoa. Um, so they were out there doing Dustoff with people who, I mean, I don't want to say underqualified, but just didn't have the skill set they necessarily needed? Right. So shit, because because what happens? So people again, people have good ideas, but they forget like all the logistics that go into it. And the yeah. good idea was to push surgeons forward, you know, to, to get to the people who were bleeding out that couldn't be stopped by tourniquets or whatever else. So we could go in there, stop yeah. the bleeding. So we were just damage control. We weren't trying to fix the problem. We we're just trying to stop the bleeding. Great idea, except they forgot the transport part of it because the dust off. So now when they when we did that. The patients were now on a ventilator. They were getting blood, you know, sedation, paralytics, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Those those medics didn't have that skill set because at the time, the dust off medic could have been an EMT. They could have yeah. been a paramedic. You just didn't know what you're getting. So there wasn't really a standard across the board. They were great with the point of injury. They're great with airway. But when it came to critical care transport, that's a whole nother, that's an ICU level. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like a level of care higher than what they're capable of. Yes. And mind you, I didn't get all my critical care training either. So <laughs> I was, this is such a, I wasn't this even is qualified. Such a military story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so before, you know, we pushed out, we kind of went through and was like, all right, if this has to, because we already knew this was a problem. This actually had been a problem for a while. And I don't, you know, military doesn't really move very 
quickly. So, yeah. Because it was a problem in Iraq back in like 2003 and four, and you know, the nurses had been screaming about like, you're just throwing us on the back of helicopters transporting patients without any real training. And so, um, cut to 2010 where I am, and it's still an issue. And so, my OIC was like, you know, if we have to, someone has to fly who's going to volunteer. And, you know, because I don't think about things. I'm like, oh, sure, I'll go. Yeah. Well, at least you had the experience with helicopters too, though. <laughs> and that's what I was, you know, it was like, I'm very familiar with helicopters. In my mind, I was thinking like, oh, sure, they'll come. They'll bring me a helmet. They'll bring me what I need because no. I'm obviously not air crews. So I don't no. have any of the gear. They're bringing you none of that. Yeah. So <laughs> the first patient we get and we're doing the, we're cleaning him up, cutting off the rest of his leg, doing whatever. And it kind of hit me halfway through the surgery, like, I have to fly this guy. <laughs> I'm like, I really am not very good with vents. Don't really, I haven't really worked with paralytics or sedation. So whenever to my anesthesiologist, I'm like, hey, what meds do I need? And he's like, oh, just, you know, take this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, crash little, little yeah. uh, training. And then, then it was night on top of it. And then I'm thinking, well, I have the medic, so we're, we're good, you know. And, you know, he comes in and he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't do that stuff. So I was like, okay. I said, but you have, you have comms for me. Right. And he's mm. like, uh, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> and I was like, do you have earplugs then? <laughs> I was like, anything. So we start walking out to the, the helicopter and it's just hitting me. And I'm like, this is, this is not good. <laughs> I mean, cause <laughs> you're really bad. <laughs> what you're describing. So now, so the guy steps on an IED. Mm-hmm probably on the scene they're probably throwing multiple tourniquets on there trying to get them to you guys the next high right. level of care right you're cleaning up getting ready for stabilization yes. and then you are responsible for keeping this person alive uh-huh. probably find them down to kandahar or wherever yeah the wire is where i was going yeah yeah, yeah to the down. next the roll three so yeah. yeah that's exactly what happened and so again i think and i would have the medics help but the medic we get in and he's like he goes and sits on the left side and is like yeah i gotta make sure you know i gotta look out and because i don't i don't do that and i was just like Okay, so basically I'm in a squat position in the back of the 60 with this patient who still needs resuscitation in the dark. I have no way to communicate with the crew. Wow. I've got one of those little pen lights between my teeth yeah. <laughs> for my light. Never done this before. I really, de- you know, I'm like, this vent goes, I really don't know a lot about this thing, so this is going to suck. Holy um, cow. Yeah. So that was that was my first flight. And then we, we landed Dwyer. And I, I wrote on the guy, the crew chief's little notepad. I said, you're going to take me back, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thumbs up, right? I'm like, okay, cool. Because I don't know where the hell I'm at, right? Yeah. So I go in. I have to go in and talk to the trauma team, which that was a freaking disaster. Just so many lessons learned with that, that one flight. I thought I'd walk in, maybe pull the doctor aside, give a little report. I start going down the sidewalk, and you can see the opening to the tent, of the trauma tent. And you, I swear there was like 30 people like in a semicircle with their arms crossed, just staring at me. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So I walk in and I was like, oh, where's the doctor? And they're like, oh, just send it. What do you got? Just, you know, didn't prepare for that at all. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of, I'm not a great public speaker anyway. And I was just like, mine completely goes blank. And the guys had gone and, and grabbed the patient and they're coming up behind me. And I, they walk past me and I see the monitor. And I was like, uh, this, um, this, this guy, he no, he doesn't have a leg. Uh, th- he's got a heart rate sixty. <laughs> it's it's my like, first day, people. Yeah. Cut me some slack. I'm, and they're just looking at me, and I'm like, uh, d- yeah. <laughs> That's a lot to handle in your first evolution like that, though. Oh yeah, I mean, it was just you know the whole time I'm flying, I'm I'm trying to like, how am I getting back? And I'm just thinking of like fifteen other things on top of it. And as I'm giving the report, my really shitty report. The helicopter flies away. <laughs> One of the surgeons goes, was that your ride? <laughs> it's like, uh-huh. Indeed it was. It was. <laughs> Where am I again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had to figure out on my own. I had, and I had to take all my gear. So I had my litter. I had all my equipment. And I'm dragging it up to this little shack where the, the planes were coming in and out of. And this was like october or november this is cold mm-hmm. i can't what people don't realize it gets cold in afghanistan it's kind of like las vegas Very. it's yes. almost uh as if that <clears throat> uh mountain range the hindu kush mountain range is part of the himalayas yeah, yeah yeah exactly and even you know in the southern area it was very cold so coldest i've ever been in my life is in the desert yes people yes yeah they only associate it with being hot yeah the worst part about the desert is it can be like almost a 100 degree temperature swing from the day yes. to the night and you're so screwed yes yes yeah. 
So another lesson is I didn't bring any extra clothes or anything because just, you know, thought I'd get Why would my you? Ride you had back. a ride. Yeah. So I go up there and I'm like, hey, I, I need to get back to, to pain. And he's like, oh, yeah, we, have, we don't have anything. And it's I think it's like nine or 10 o'clock at this point. I'm like, OK, so. He's like, just go sit out, sit over there outside, and I'll let you know. <laughs> so I'm, sit, I'm freezing my ass off on this wooden bench by myself. And then around two in the morning, he's like, hey, we got a 53 going that way. If you want to hop on, it's like, planes, okay. trains, and automobiles of <laughs> Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, I have no way to communicate with my team. So I'm like, I wonder if they think I'm still wow. alive or not. <laughs> so fast forward a couple months, I bet you had had. I mean, in a short period of time, I bet you had that whole process dialed. I did because I we then moved up to Delarum, and on Delarum was a little bit bigger, so Payne was just a combat outpost. There really wasn't anything out there. Mm -hmm. Delarum was a fob, and so Dustoff was stationed there. And the first thing I did was I walked my ass over there, and I said, "Listen, guys, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably gonna be flying with you, and one, you're not gonna freaking leave me because I will come back here and kill you." Um, I need some way to communicate with you guys. And, you know, I'm sure they're like, who's this bitch coming in here? <laughs> That's that. the term they used for sure. Oh, I'm sure. Not when yeah. you were standing there. Though. Yeah. Of course. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> after a while, like we, we would hang out and we yeah. train together. And so we, we built up a rapport. And then like to this day, I still talk to a lot of them. So, yeah, it was great. And and I got smart on my first one. I was like, the medic's coming with me into <laughs> giving a report. And I'm, I will handcuff myself to this guy. Take a mandatory because, piece of gear so yes, the helicopter can yes. leave. I, like I was it. like, I you like guys won't out. leave him. <laughs> You'll leave me, but you're not going to leave him. So he's coming with me. So, yeah. Smart. Yes. And then it got to a point where we, you know, we all got close and they weren't going to leave me. So, yeah. Was that so in the what you had described, although it uh, seemed clunky because it was your first evolution out is that largely what you did through that deployment was stabilize next level of care you would go with them yes so i was i was actually i uh, had experience in emergency medicine with my prior experience and then the critical care stuff and then the flying so i would have the benefit when they when they came in i would go into the resuscitation tent and help them in there then i would go on to the or and help them in there and then i would get dressed up to to fly so yeah. i knew at that point I knew what happened to the patient as soon as they got to us and then all the care that was given to them throughout. So it was much easier to give that report. And I, like you said, I dialed it in at that point. Yeah. But I came back from that deployment. I was pissed because I was like, I cannot believe we're doing this to people. Like we're putting them in this situation. And, you know, for me, I was in my 30s. I had all that air crew experience. Um, and I still was just, I was like, I remember that first flight. Like I am completely, it was one of those, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> like, and let's not, for, let's this not forget at the time of your first flight, we're talking nine years into this. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's a really, really slow learning curve. Yes. So I came back and I said, I cannot believe we don't, aren't training people appropriately because if you, the civilian flight, you know, community, if you, if you're hired with like Mercy Air or whatever, there is a whole program you go through and it oh, takes yeah, about, dialed. yeah, I mean, and you have to have a preceptor after you go to their school, um, for Mercy Air is in Denver, you go there for two weeks, didactics, cadavers, all kinds of stuff. Then you go back to your station and you're writing with them, you know, you have a preceptor, you have to have so many patient contacts and, and, and that's, that's normal. It's everywhere in the hospital. If you go to the ER, the ICU, same thing, you have a six month, you know, three to six month orientation, depending on where you're going. And I'm like, but yet this is the one area <laughs> with like the most, you know, volatile environment. Like you're you cannot that, predict you, this. Yeah, you're seeing like Mercy Air level trauma on the daily. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Worse. I mean, these guys, you know, I had triple amputees, double yeah. amputees all the time. And it's like, you know, open book pelvic fractures. I mean, it was just, you know, I'm literally resuscitating them still. And so when you say resuscitating, you mean you're putting somebody on a device that's breathing for them? So a ventilator, um, but giving them blood. Okay. Um, so I have, there's one picture in on my IG that has kind of been circulated a lot, but I'm in a squat position and that guy is getting four units of blood that I'm just, I've got on pressure bags and then he's ventilated. Unit being one bag? No, it's four different lines. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause he was, he was, I think he was my pelvic guy and he was just dumping blood into his pelvis. And so I was trying to get him as fast as I could to the roll three. Um, cause that's going, a surgical intervention. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so he's going in and out of a uh, PEA, which is, um, pulseless electrical activity, which, because there's not enough blood in his body. So his heart's not able to pump anything. So the heart's beating, but there's just nothing yeah. to circulate. So, 
um, when you check pulses distally, there are any pulses because yeah, there's no there's hydraulic no fluid going through there. Exactly. So I'm just dumping as much blood as possible into him so I could, you know, give him some kind of a pressure and pulses till yeah. I could get him to a, a surgeon. Did he end up making it? He, I think he did um, initially, but they were using so much blood on him. He was another ANA. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a point where we got to save some of that for our own. So yeah, yeah, or just anybody else, our own or anybody else. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. I had a buddy um, made it all the way through a SEAL career and decided uh, he wanted to contract. Stepped on a pressure plate shortly after. Double, I think one below, one above the knee. Yeah. But from what I was told, he took every usable pint of blood yes. in Kandahar. Yep. Yeah, gnarly. Crashed on the table a few times. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and then so in this motherfucker has the most positive outlook of anybody now. I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah. yeah. Like, allow me to be negative. <laughs> I know. Give I me know. <laughs> something to bitch about. You have no goddamn legs, and you're the most positive person I know. Fuck. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. Well, oftentimes they are. So it's shocking to me how many times I have talked to people who have had a crazy traumatic event like that, and it's yeah. a total reset for them. Yep. Um, when it comes to like gratitude and appreciation, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's true. Um, you actually did a podcast with Nick Norris, right? Yes. I think he talked about his The experience. shortest Navy SEAL ever. <laughs> he's, yep. He's not he's, that short. He is weak. <laughs> he has to get on a stool to look over the top of this table. <laughs> this table's two feet tall. I did not say that, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He would be mad at me if I didn't say that. No, Nick's awesome. Yes. Yeah. I've worked with him um, a little bit. So, yeah, he's uh, was telling me about his experience in Hawaii and I think he yeah where he basically died it. yeah yeah yep. just, again that kind of new appreciation for it's for interesting and- I think a near life a near near life I think a near death experience <laughs> once in a lifetime maybe about a halfway through may not be a bad thing yeah no yeah. may not be a bad thing yeah what was the uh what was the hardest day for you over there do you can you think back of the lowest point when you were doing that 10 month or um yeah, so one of the so when we were transitioning from Payne to Delarum, we stopped at Bastion for a few days. And my surgeon said, Hey, go to the OR at Bastion and get some experience because when we're out there as damage control, I wasn't an OR nurse. So I'd never really been in the OR before and but I'm trying to circulate for them and, and help mm-hmm. them out in the, the surgical tent. And so he was like, Hey, this is an opportunity to go into the OR get some experience with that before we push up to Delaron. So we go into the OR and the way that Bastion was, is they had a, it was like a six bed open bay OR. So you go into the big, they call it the theater. You go into the theater and there's six beds. You can see yeah. all around you instead of being individual OR rooms that you're used to. And I think we got there at like, it was like six or seven in the morning. And all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. And what happened was three five had taken over singing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you dark horse. Um, they took probably the worst casualties I think of the unit. No, I haven't heard unit. about this. They took over singing. Um, yeah, look, read about it. It's it's going to be one of those you know going on you know, historical yeah. moments. Um, but yeah, so they take over and we're just you know it's like six incoming or it was like six incoming four heroes. So they were calling heroes the ones that had yeah. passed away before they got there. Um, we always called those expectant. Instead of saying, you know, deceased, because I think that allowed them to process some paperwork on the back end. Yeah. Preserving benefits for significant others. Yes. Yep. So, um, but yeah, so we'd have all these, these guys were coming in and it was just, you know, once we cleared them out, it'd be six more coming in or however many more coming in. And at one point, so the common injuries were bilateral, bilateral amputations and then their genitals. Yeah. Because, you know, the Marines are pretty weighed down with all their gear and they would step on one of those IEDs and it would just go right up through the core. Like yep. instead of being like pushed to one side or whatever. I got to a point like I don't rattle very easily, you know, even if I'm scared of something, it's like I'll just, you know, put my head down and do it. <laughs> I got to a point where I was like, if I see one more 20 year old without his fucking dick, I'm going to lose my shit. So, yeah, that's, you know, people don't talk a lot about that particular aspect of IED injuries, specifically like a pressure plate or something that explodes underneath you. Yeah. Yeah. You might, you might live, 
but your life is a little different. Yes. Yeah. And so we had, you know, another bench come in and when you're the OR team, you, you want to stand behind the line, let the ER team do their thing. Cause you don't want to interfere with what they're doing. Then we, we go and pick the worst ones and then we bring them back to the OR. And I was standing there and there's this kid that comes in and I see what he's already missing a leg and then his other legs pretty damaged. But I saw his dick and I was like, oh, thank God. He's got his dick. We got one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we bring him back to our table and I'm helping my surgeon cut off his other leg because it was just so yeah. badly damaged. And I look over and the general general surgeon like lifts up his penis and cuts it off. And I, <laughs> Why would he do that? So that was a moment I lost my shit. I think it was the one and only moment I freaking was like, what the fuck <laughs> what yeah did why did he do that so he was like there's nothing in here and so what i saw was just the skin okay his the heel of his boot had blown into his pelvis and so he like brings out the heel of the boot like you yeah. know grabs it out of there and he's like there's it shredded the the whole inside so um so yeah fuck yeah and then at that moment my orthopedic surgeon had cut off the leg i'm holding this leg so i'm holding this leg I'm like freaking out on this dude. And like after he tells me that, I kind of turn around. I'm like, I've got I've got this guy's leg in my hand. Like, what what, what am I doing with this? And I almost slip on the blood. That's because it's just a bloody Covered, yeah. mess. Cause there's six beds full of people and Similar body parts. Condition, and yeah. It was a moment where I was like, I'm in the middle of the fucking movie saw. Like, this is my life right now. There's arms and legs sitting in biohazard bags. I'm holding on to a leg. Like what blood they everywhere. They would chop them up and burn them right to the burn pit <laughs> fuck <laughs> and we're back on the burn pits <laughs> holy shit yeah it i don't i can't even imagine the weight of that yeah and then the weight of that day on top of day on top of day not to that level probably but you know yeah. it's when i talk to law enforcement or i talk to people in that in the first responder world i don't think people realize that the people who work in that world are catching people on their worst day Yes. It's constantly you're seeing them on their worst day, not their best yes. day. It's just it's like this negative, 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 yes. negative. Yeah. It's hard. <sighs> and, you know, like, you know, I'm an emergency room nurse and I have a triage for me is the worst place to be in because you're seeing everybody. You have to, you know, screen everybody. You're yeah. deciding whether what, what category they fit into. And I have about a two to three hour threshold for that because you just get to, like if you're sick and you need help, I am your girl, I will do everything in my power, but you get a lot of people that are just clogging up the system, and there's, you know, I like, so many times they'd have, like, a 25-year-old, I have, my stomach hurts, and I'm nauseous, and I'm like, and you would like me to do what for you? <laughs> like, it's Here's just... a prescription for fuck right off. <laughs> I mean, it's like, like, what do you, like, did you not learn to, like, hey, if you're not feeling well, if you have an upset tummy, go lay in bed, yeah. eat some soup, you know, it's just, like people come to the ER for everything. So a lot of people use it for their primary care. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, and it's a problem. And I feel bad for them because they're like, well, I can't. And I get it because if they have like a sore throat or whatever, you kind of want that sort of taken care of right away. And they're like, oh, our next appointment is, you know, a month from now. And it's like, yeah. okay. And that's going to do what for me. So I, I get it in that aspect. But yeah, our, our systems need to be taken a look at for sure. Yeah. So at the end of that deployment, what? how did your career progress after that? So I come back and, again, the nursing world is, you know, a lot of times when people come off deployments, you get some downtime. Yeah. I don't know, usually. It's usually considered healthy to yes. give somebody some downtime. Yeah. And I think, like, right, like how much downtime would you get if you went? Uh, well, let's see. It varied. Okay. Um, well, if you did, like, a 10-monther, did you, do, did you ever do I that? did. Okay. Uh, zero. I got oh. no time off because I came back on a Red Cross message. My mom was in palliative care for cancer. Oh. The night I got shot, I was home 48 hours later. Um, and then, let's see, most of the time we would just get on the airplane. So they had they instituted a program called TLD, Third Location Decompression, where they would stop. I think it was mostly in Germany, and I never got that. So for me, it was almost uh, direct from where we were back home. But when – so once you're home, though, like – when would they expect you Week to like, two. come back into work? And oh, you got to turn stuff in. You got to turn in all your serialized gear. So you'd probably be back in for the first few days. Yeah. And then you could throw a leaf sheet in for, depending on what was coming up, up to two weeks, two to three weeks maybe. Yeah. So 
I come back. So I had just done Haiti, Afghanistan, pretty much back to back. Come back and, you know, nurse supervisor is like, hey, when you when you coming back? <laughs> and I'm like, um, second week in <laughs> February. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, well, I see you, you know. So yeah. again, go right into twelve-hour shifts, and and she's like, we're gonna put you on nights because you know you've been gone a while, and the other girls have been working nights, so it's just it's only fair. And I'm like, I wasn't Is on it only fucking fair? vacation. <laughs> God, <laughs> it's only fair. <laughs> Fuck. I'm like, you. do you do you know what I was? Do- okay, yeah, all right. Well, you know, they could have deployed too. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, so go right back into nights, like within two weeks still haven't really wrapped my head around anything I have done, you know, yeah. from Haiti to Afghanistan and everything else. And which I'm of the opinion now it takes years to wrap your head around it anyway. It does. It's not, it does, it's not a but, matter of days or weeks. Right. It does. Um, but I just, you know, my time zone, like everything was just off and I just yep. was like, okay, so go back in and, um, do that. At this point, I'm supposed to be calling for orders. So my whole time at Pendleton so far has been either training or on deployment. And so I call and I, I wanted again to stay in that area. And so she was like, well, um, there's, there's some operational billets. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I just want to stay in this area. So I put it for the operational billets for the nursing, you have to put in your preference. And there were a couple of Marine Corps ones. And then there was one that was at a training installation on Pendleton that was considered operational. I'm like, oh, and she even said like, oh, this would be great for you because it's expeditionary medicine. You just got back off of a couple of deployments. You'd be great for this to, to, to teach. And so I was like, oh, that'd be great. And she's like, and it's non-deployable because it's a, it's a instructor billet. Perfect. So put in for, it was like the Marine Corps billets. Cause I just got, you know, I knew a lot about them now. Mm-hmm. And then this training one as my number one. She calls me and she says, hey, you got selected, but you're going to go on a ship. <laughs> and I was like, nowhere did I say anything. <laughs> about I was actively ship. trying to avoid that. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. And she was like, it's a fleet surgical team and it's going to be on one of the LHDs and blah, blah, blah. And so, which is what I was on in Haiti. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm a little familiar with that. And so I call the guy I'm replacing and I said, hey, I'm going to be your replacement. <laughs> Give me some beta. Yeah. And she was, well, when I took the order, she's like, I'm going to have to pull you early because they, the guy is going to be leaving soon. Did some research and they're like, oh, FSC, it just depends on the ship cycle of when you're deploying. So mm. you could maybe even not, you know, you're there for two years. You could not even get a deployment. Yeah, they because might be in between their, cycles. Yeah, just depending on where they are. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I call him and I'm like, hey, I'm your replacement. And he's like, oh, great, because we're, <laughs> we're getting ready to deploy. <laughs> I was like, of course we are. <laughs> so turn around, go back to the Middle East. <laughs> Six months. <laughs> Good God. Yeah. So fun times. How did you end up in New York working at a hospital in the peak of what I, I mean, not an expert on COVID. Right. I had it. Uh, really? Yeah. La, end of November. Okay. So I'm, basically a superhero i think uh-huh. i have like 80 some more days left because they said for 90 i'm good but i think i'm gonna have at least six months um were you symptomatic did you know you had it i would not have gotten tested until i lost my sense of taste and smell because oh, okay. i had heard that so much i had a few days of body aches but in comparison to things that i have worked through or tolerated throughout the course of my life here's the way i describe it if i hadn't been bombarded with the news mm-hmm. I would not have known, um, absent all, and I'm, I'm not, God, I have to be careful because people get super twisted. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying it doesn't kill people. What I'm saying is if <laughs> nobody just... knew that this was happening, it would have been a below average cold for me. Right. And I only went and got tested because of the hearing about the issues with taste. And I had another buddy who got tested. Uh, he had had it um, a few months before. And he was like, yeah, man, I couldn't taste. So I went in and that was like the number one indicator. So I went in only because of that. Otherwise, I would not have. Yeah. So symptomatic, yes, but very minor. But I also am of the opinion that I think you come out of it with what you go into it. And I'm active and I try to, you know, I try to, I'm not in a high risk category group, I guess is what I'm saying. I agree. But yeah, I remember um, 
shortly, I think, after I reached out to you the very first time after you were on mics, is that's when I think you got surged to New York. So you were still, were you still in the military or you had separated at that point? I'd already retired. Okay. Yes. And you reached out right after because I actually got off the plane from New York home and turned on my phone and there was a message from me and I'm like, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Andy, Perfect <stop."> timing. <laughs> Perfect How timing. You know who I am? Yeah. I was like, yeah. Um, but, but that I think when you were there, I mean, I remember them talking about putting up a field town hospital in like Times Square, not Times Square, the uh, Central Park. Yes. Yeah, so it was there, like when things, the velocity of at least, I think, I don't know about the cases or death, whatever it was, but every arrow was pointed at least a 45 degree angle. Up. Right. So we went and set up a field hospital. Um, what was unique about what we were doing, we so we were in conjunction with New York Presbyterian System. Okay. And how did it even line up that you ended up going out? Because you were living in the West Coast, right? Yes. So, so, so there was went? a whole message put out um, through uh, a lot of the networks that were military networks. Okay. And they had they had heard that New York was looking for you know people to come help. And so I, this one specific one, I don't really, it went through the federal government somehow. And then it filtered down and then a, the people who got it put it out to the network like hey if you're interested drop your resume to this person blah 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 um one of the uh i believe she's retired colonel she picked it up and went over there to see what was going on and then so she became the actual med director for it and started you know calling or going through all the lists of the people that had put in i was one of the people that initial people i put in for it and so we went out there and what was unique is that they allowed us and it was under their medical emergency, whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. to bring medics back to work without any kind of license. So like, cause, because the- Interesting. Yes. So um, Melissa Givens, who was the med director, or the director of the whole operation, you know, we were like, we have all these basically like soft medics that have a very high skill set. Yeah, but they're not licensed anywhere. They're not licensed anywhere. So can we bring these people back to basically, you know, be adjuncts to the nurses and whatever mm -hmm. else, um, or to be at, act as nurses? Oh shit, they'd be an incredible value add whether they're active oh, yeah. or an adjunct. Right, yeah. and it's and it's stuff that we've all been saying. So it was kind of an opportunity to put our theory into play that these guys can basically walk into a hospital and you know have a little bit of training and be good to go. Yeah, and so. We were bringing, we had, you know, soft medics from every type of community that would, that were coming in. And so the way it was designed, like, so I had a row of 36 beds that I was responsible for as the licensed nurse. And then I had two teams of these soft medics, paramedics, all these, these people. So two teams of six and, you know, one would be on one side, the other would be on the other side. And so the team lead of those teams would be the actual RN, mm -hmm. um, but I was I was the licensed one, kind of overseeing what they were doing, and so the first couple of days a little stressful because I mean these guys are amazing, but they weren't really used to patients who had comorbidities and you know yeah. diabetes and you know cardiac issues and whatever. Like they're great with the traumas and all that stuff, but just hadn't seen stuff like this. Yeah. And then now you're you're dealing with insulin, like these med profiles that are like pages long, and you know they're not used to a lot of these medications. Um, so it's kind of me running around making sure that, you know, they weren't giving the wrong insulin dose because that can really, you know, fuck you up pretty bad and, and that type of thing. But it, I think I worked myself out of a job within a couple of days. And these guys learned so fast and they were Sponges. just amazing. Yeah. And I kind of thought, my thought process at first was like, these guys might come in and be like, uh, I'm not doing this, <laughs> you know, because it's, it was nursing. So you're cleaning yeah butts and you know doing all the the nursing care most people don't really care for you know cleaning them up and making sure that they're eating and you know all their millions of medications and whatever so um so you were stationed at one of those field hospitals yes so we we had put our field hospital in columbia universities we used their indoor soccer interesting tent thing yeah dome dome yeah, yeah. whatever it was we called it the bubble it's the covid bubble because all our patients were positive um, but yeah, so it's, I mean, they learned quickly. They were completely receptive to learning. They wanted to learn. Um, I thought they would be, you know, kind of like, oh, I got to do vital signs. Cause you know, you gotta do vital signs every so often all about it. I mean, they were just so eager to, to work and be there. And so it was, it was amazing. Like I, I loved yeah. being able to do it. It was hard and it was a lot of work cause, um, the initial people we went 
10 days straight, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was exhausted by that point. No, I bet. So yeah, it was, no, but it was, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Was it as bad as the news was making it sound? I mean, they, I think at that time that you were there, it, it was probably most aptly described as the sky is falling. So <laughs> like, I mean, I remember the initial death tolls, like two or three million. Yeah. And let's not say, I mean, I think we're probably at close to 300,000. Now that's not a small number right. at all, but if you look at the other causes of death and you know what I mean? Like there's, there's other things you can look at and then in comparison and contrast, it's not as massive a number. Again, I don't want anybody to die. <laughs> oh, people are very sensitive about this They're topic. They're super sensitive. <laughs> and, but here's the thing, and I'm not an expert on it at all. And that's why I'm fascinated about how your actual experiences were on the front line because on the news it was just like well that's the end of new york yeah and that's what i kind of expected going into it um i do know elmhurst which you saw a lot on the news they were getting a ton of patients and they were getting pretty overran um there were so we had our field hospital there was another one set up at the billy jean tennis center or whatever um the comfort had come up Mm mm-hmm Javits Center, which was the, I believe, it was National Guard, so they had another 400 beds there. Um, I want to say there probably was another field hospital somewhere, and we never reached, even came close to capacity. Which is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that's the case. I, I'm right. glad that they were so proactive in their measures. But I, and I can again watching it from afar, I'm like, holy shit! Like this field hospital is going up, but I never see a picture from inside of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like they're telling me the sky is falling, but I never see a picture of these hospitals bursting at the seams. Not that there weren't certain hospitals that were. It's yeah. just it's tough to get any insight from somebody who was directly dealing with that because there are some people who are using the Internet and all of its facilities and capacities <laughs> to, like, do these monologues. And it, it's like, mm-hmm. fuck, OK, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to take it. So I just kind of sit back and I don't do anything with it. I'm like, huh. Interesting. I just, I honestly think it's hit or miss with the facilities of who's getting hit. Um, Elmhurst, I think, is a community hospital. So they're, you know, they take anybody and they were getting hit the hardest. Yeah. Um, you know, and think about their population. Probably not the healthiest because you got a lot of homeless and people who yeah. aren't getting medical care regularly. Um, then you can talk, you know, I have nurses that I, I'm good friends with who took contracts to LA because they said LA was the next New York yeah. and we're getting canceled because they didn't even have enough work for their, their own nurses. So, um, Balbo is ER, which I, you know, pretty am. We, for a while, were pretty quiet yeah. <laughs> during a lot of this. So I don't know. I just, so what are I your personal it's... thoughts? Tell me. <laughs> Everything you think about COVID. You're trying to get me crucified. I'm not trying to get you crucified. I just. I, so I get a little bit of controversy because I, my whole thing with it is the mask thing, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you're going to mandate a mask, it should be standard because I'm sorry, a piece of cloth over my face, I don't think is doing much. That was one of my things that I didn't understand. They said. That mask. And for clarity, again, people, when I go places <laughs> where a mask is required, like the grocery store, I wear a mask. But my mask is a ski buff because I just throw it around my neck. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Yeah. And it's not an N95 mask. And it's not a scuba mask, which I've seen. And it's not a stormtrooper mask, right. which I've seen. Right. But I didn't understand why they said everybody has to wear a mask, but they didn't say what type of mask. Right. And that's, I mean. Because you see people you know fuckery levels are high when people have too much time off and they're yes. like wearing lace masks yeah, or a seen, ma- like I've a chain seen, link fence mask yes. it's like yeah, i can see your <laughs> mouth like <laughs> and that's the thing i see you know a yarn mask you know yeah. and it's just like this isn't you know the fact that people will give me dirty looks or give me shit for not wearing one but if i went in the bathroom and put my underwear over my head they'd be like good job you know like that's concerning to me because i've said if there is a you know, much deadlier virus, which there probably will be. Yeah. And people, this is kind of forming a false sense of security that, you know, a piece of cloth is going to save me from a virus, you know? So that's my concern. And that's what I've always said. And I get so much, I get a lot of hate mail on Instagram because every time I say that people interpret it as, oh, you don't, you think it's fake and you, you don't believe in masks. And I was like, 
not at all what I said. Yeah. You know, I think if you masks, actually bother yeah. to read what I say, you know, like that's not, I, of course I don't think COVID's fake. I freaking treated, I don't know how many people, you know, yeah. on many different areas. So, you know, I'm just saying that you should have a standard. <laughs> yeah. I think they could totally make a difference, but again, let's have a standard. And I just, the one thing, the one thing that is upsetting me the most is that so many people are put it like using masks as an example. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not wearing a mask, you're a fucking communist. Like, yeah. you're some, like, you're not American. It's like, yeah. first off, eat all the dicks. Yeah. But why can't we put the emphasis on health and wellness? Right. Like, if you want a scary stat, look at the number of people in the United States that are obese right. by, via percentage. And it would be higher if they stopped moving the percent. It was like, it used to be, I think, like, the 70s it was like low teens for body fat. Right. And then they're like, nah, 15%, nah, 17%, nah, 19%. Yeah. It's not like people are- 23. Yeah, it's, it's not like we have less people that are be creeping towards morbidly obese. They just keep moving the fucking metric right. to make it seem like it's more in control. Like, right. what if, how about we made post-COVID, which, spoiler alert, people, there would be a post-COVID, but COVID 21 or 22 could be right around the corner. Yeah. Why can't we put this emphasis on individual accountability and responsibility to be as healthy as humanly possible? Right. Let's I mean, again, and I'm not a doctor, gyms. but <laughs> fuck. They closed all the gyms and you can't get freaking gym equipment anywhere or toilet paper. Um, yeah. yeah. Take exercise I just, away from people, a yeah. physical and emotional outlet and buffer. And that's not, I don't know. I, you know, in my concern are the, the second, third order effects of all this, right? All these yeah. poor businesses that I don't know why people can't understand. And it, they get so mad at me when I talk about this. And I'm like, can you imagine having a family and you're dependent on your paycheck that's coming next week? And all of a sudden that paycheck's not coming and you don't know when it's going to come. And your kids need food. You need to pay your mortgage. You need to pay your car notes. You need it, whatever. Yeah. And now you literally, within a week or two, have no idea where you're going to get money or where your income is going to come. Can you imagine that? No. You know, are you? And dependent? I would do everything that I could to make sure that my family survived. Right. And, and if that and, meant keeping my business open, yes. guess what? I would. If that was my means of providing, yes. then yes, I'm going to do that. I don't think people like really think about that. And and I always and I say to like you know some of the I'm going to get crucified, but. In healthcare, we are very, very fortunate to have a job and we have a paycheck. We're essential, right? And I think some of them forget what it's like to yep. not have that coming. Now, if I told you that your paycheck's not going to come next week, you're cool with that, right? I think there would be a little bit different train of thoughts, you know? So in New York, that was April. Mm -hmm. We had, so they, you know, a lot of businesses were giving us food um, for the workers, but there was a lot of leftovers. So a lot of us would go and we'd grab the food and we would start handing it out um, on the streets to the mm. homeless. And I'm telling you, this is April. There were some of those people looked very newly homeless. I mean, there was a guy in a full suit that was sleeping on the sidewalk with newspapers covering him. No shit. Yes. I mean, There's, so this is, you know, Kalispell is obviously small in comparison to New York, but I see the impact here. I mean, so the main, yeah. the main street is, you know, there's more open... Uh, commercial real estate now, and I've only lived here for three years, but there's more open commercial real estate now than I've seen in the past three years. And that has happened during this time period. You can see it where they're trying to hold on, trying to do everything that they can. And then they're doing the long-term math of not knowing when, you know, from my understanding, the Flathead Valley area, a lot of it, you know, summertime and wintertime, but it's tourism. Right. People will come in the summer for the lake and it's just beautiful. And then the wintertime, one of the best resorts in the world is up in Whitefish. Uh, Canadian border shut down. A lot of people used to come down. So a lot of the revenue streams are getting cut. And you see these local businesses, they're doing everything they can. They're yeah. holding on. They're following all the mask mandates and guidelines and all that. And they're not getting the traffic. Restaurants are at, you know, they're told to close at this hour because apparently after 10, things get more dangerous. Yeah. Um, and then they have minimum capacity, which they're already operating on a shitty margin on a great. Right. It's, it's like, what do you expect them to do? Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing. You're telling people to shut down, shut down, shut down, and there's no solutions for them. And that's, and again, that's what I've been saying is, you know, there's the hypocrisy that, that surrounds us, you know, is just, you've got all these people closing businesses, but yet you have 
you know, the governor of California is going out with his buddies and his restaurants and his wineries that are all staying open. And steps, so. Yeah, he <laughs> steps in shit. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that one. <laughs> I, have I you found there to be, podcast. yeah, have you found there to be a lot of division inside of the medical community on, I don't want to say the severity of COVID, but like the long term or short term or, or just an attitude in general? Or is it pretty, everybody's got the same? No, there there's uh, seems to be a lot of division. And, you know, again, it goes with if you don't think like certain people, then you're just you're the devil and evil. And I just I offer other perspectives is what I try to do. And, you know, if if I'm not on that stay home, wear your mask and forever and ever and ever. And God knows, you know, with no end to this. Yeah. I'm, I'm this terrible person. And like, I've been, people have tagged me in like other nurses posts who like say that and, you know, like, you know, the misinformation that, that I put out, you know, go check out her page. And I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, go to my page and tell me the misinformation. We can have a, we can have a conversation about this. You know, if you don't agree with something I'm saying, I have never again, once said that it's fake or, you know, masks don't work. I've never said that I'm saying, you know, the standard and whatever else. And then what are we doing about all these businesses who are now closing, who now you have an increase in homelessness, an increase of starvation, you know, what, what are the solutions for that? Yeah. The cascading because, effects, I think in the, in the longer term as the optic gets larger are going to be substantially worse than the short term impacts of right. however long it's going to take to navigate through this. And, and I don't know why it's become political. <laughs> like I don't understand this. I mean, is anything like not at this I point? Know, I know. <laughs> This year has been. It's, Whew. yeah, dumpster fire. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the vaccine? I, <laughs> well, oh, here's the thing. I'm not rushing in line to take it because I was uh, at the front of the line for the anthrax vaccine, which I didn't take. Yeah. I squirted it into the garbage can. Mm-hmm. And I know some people who've had some pretty shitty medical conditions from that. And I'm not I saying do. vaccines <laughs> don't work, people. <laughs> What I'm saying is, is I'm hesitant to be in the front row of receiving that. I want to see how effective it is and what the side effects are. So I, uh, one of my duty stations, I ran the immunization clinic and anthrax was big at this point, or it was like just, we were starting to give it. Yeah. It was like a series of eight, right? It's the initial, it's supposed to be six, but what happens is records get lost, you know, people don't, whatever, and then they, they're restarting the series. I don't even know how many times. Um, I remember I was on my way to work, and I'd heard a news thing about, because Anthrax was open to civilians and mm-hmm. the general public, and they had they had recalled that, and they it's no longer available for civilians because of the side effects that were happening, which was muscle deterioration, nerve problems, all this stuff. I go into work and I go to my OIC and I said, hey, like I just heard this news report about anthrax and, you know, I maybe like what what should we stop because, you know, we're giving this out or whatever. And he's he's like, no, just do what you're told. Like we haven't gotten word to stop. So just, you know, do what you're told. And it was just like, hmm, OK, <laughs> so that, that's kind of my experience with that. And then, you know, come to find out it's it's caused a lot of problems. It and so fucks some people up for the rest of their life. Yeah. And not everybody. <laughs> No, nope. but some. Yes. So, you know, the fact if you want to get it, by all means, if you think it's going to protect you, you know, am I skeptical a little bit because I've never seen, you know, research usually isn't conducted this quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when it's pushed and you know funded by that entity. So, yeah. um, you know, I if, just if they were to. I don't even want to say the term promise because the government is not good at that. If there was a guarantee that by going, if if I were to go and get the vaccine, that it would help small businesses get back open, I would go do it. Yeah. I wouldn't do it for my own fear of having to be exposed to it again. But again, that's my biggest concern. Right. I I, I take my health and wellness as my own personal responsibility. Right. But I don't, I, I, hate seeing the impact on small business while Target and Walmart and Amazon are having the best yes. years of their lives. Yes. And I, I, and I agree that they are, you know, they're fulfilling a service that's needed and I don't want them to disappear, but why did they, why are they more important than the mom and pop right. generational income that's now closed? Like, what the fuck? Right. I, I absolutely agree. If, if it's like everybody gets vaccines, we're going to open it next month. I'll do it. By all means. Yeah. 
you know. Until then, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a beat and see how it plays out because they're not gonna do that first off. Um, and like I said, I'm a superhero for at least another 80 days. <laughs> so I think it's six months, but I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm curious. Did you ever get retested? Uh, I was actually my, I was talking to my sister. She said not to because the chance of the false positive. Yeah. So I knew somebody who was asymptomatic and they kept getting retested just to see, you know, yeah. how long it would take to be, to be negative. Yep. Um, she was at 60 days and still testing positive. Yeah, and so I, we did the full two week quarantine plus a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll have my kids for the holidays, and I and even pushed it out. And so I have been like four weeks, and it was the first. The symptoms were gone by the time the test results came back. Yeah, and then they based the quarantine off of when the symptoms started, which was essentially the day that I got tested. So I'm, yeah, I'll be at like four weeks a month. But I was talking to my sister, and she's like, "Listen, you probably would still continue to test positive just because a they don't really know right. where the threshold is to test positive, but um, just the residual. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, again, my whole thing is, is just been, you know, it's, it's okay to question, you know, like, I think it's, it's essential to question. It is. And if you, t- it's, it's just crazy how many people, and, and when people get, you know, when I get that hate mail, it's, it's not a, like, why do you think that way? Or let's have a conversation about this. It's your fucking idiot and you're dumb i can't believe you're a nurse and your license should be taken. i mean it's that kind of thing it's like this is why those people are called dum-dums yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of them out there so they're, they're not interested in a conversation no. that's the one thing i don't like about yeah. uh, those platforms is people come fully cooked and baked with their ideas right i'm willing to engage with anybody on almost any topic yeah i have my mind changed all the time yes but if you open with you suck and you're this is i'm just like phew, moving on of course i mean yeah. that's you know you you can't have a conversation starting out that way because yeah you know starting it out negatively you know you're telling me i'm an idiot obviously we're not going to get yeah. very far and we also <laughs> agree on that first point i am an idiot so what else do you have to offer yeah <laughs> yeah you're right no um but yeah that's why i just that's the problem. That's the main problem is that we just can't seem to have a conversation without yeah. name calling, whatever else. And that's, you know, the unfortunate part of social media is people feel great connectivity. But, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that everybody has an opinion, but not all opinions in my mind are as valid. No. As you know, they're not. No. It's not an equal playing field because whether you want to admit it or not, there's some dum-dums out there <laughs> and they also have an Internet connection. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes, they do. Why would you decide to uh, get out at 24? So I was, I wanted to get out at 20. I wasn't planning on going to 24. <laughs> the old 20 and a wake up. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> even planning to go beyond five. So let's just start there. But no, at 20, I was really on the fence still and didn't, you know, wasn't quite feeling it. And, and then I got promoted uh, to Lieutenant commander at that point or like the year before. And so I was like, you know what, if I can get a good duty station, then yeah, I'll, might be worth I'll it. I'll write it out and then, you know, do the three years rank and whatever. So I uh, ended up with Pendleton at the med battalion and the CO was like, I want you to concentrate on interact care, which is what I was doing in Afghanistan, like helping with the training and whatever. I'm like, so you're offering me <laughs> to be with the Marines, which I love and to do what I love, which is interact care. I was super passionate about it. In, in an training. area that you like. Yes. I mean, I was like, okay, well, that we'll do this. And by the end of that three years, I knew I was done because at that point I'm going in the zone for 05. If I get selected, that's another three years mm-hmm. at 27 at that point might as well, you know, you might as well do 70 if you've done 27. Right. And so I was just thinking, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I'm still pretty healthy. If I want to go do other things, I'm going to have to do it now because who knows yep. six years from now where I'm going to be. So that was, that was the final. And, and I, and I felt good about it. Like, I, I think I needed that extra three years and I felt good about my decision. Really haven't looked back. Um, I think I went into a little bit of a midlife crisis though, because <laughs> picked up the most expensive hobbies you could put like long range shooting. Yep. Skydiving. Yep. Um, you started jumping. I did, which I'm terrified of heights. Remember. <laughs> That's good though. It's, but as, Whew. as I often tell people when you're that high, it's relatively abstract. Like if you want to, like what I don't like would be on top of this building, like right. forty feet, and, like, and I you get used to it. Like you'll develop that comfort. Like if you go rock climbing, you, yeah, you get used to it. But uh, I have a lot of people hit me up about skydiving. I'm like, oh, I'm terrified of heights. I'm like, I'm not a huge fan either. But at thirteen thousand feet, it's a pastel underneath yeah. you. It's yeah. not. 
It's yeah, it's, it's a it's different sensation. Yeah, and I try to tell people the same thing. Um, I did have one instructor jump where I was up at Elsinore and mm-hmm. it was kind of a cloudy day. <laughs> Because you know when you, you jump out, you don't have any perspective of how fast you're going, really. Correct. Like, it just feels like you're... Unless recorded. somebody comes zooming by you. Yeah, well, the cloud zoomed by me. Yeah. And this was around the time I was supposed to be pulling, and <laughs> I saw the yes. cloud out of the corner of my eye, and I'm like, cool, yeah. shit, I'm pulling really fast. Yeah. Oh, so you probably and, haven't fallen through a cloud yet, have you? No. That uh-huh. is a trip where you'll see your shadow way off, like, because... At, at a higher altitude, you know, it's slowly moving up to you. And then as you get closer at about a thousand feet above it, it really starts rushing. And then you'll see your shadow zipping to meet you. And you go, and you're like, that's what it would feel like to go in. <laughs> that would be the visual of what it would be like to go in. And that was a little, a little terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just the little cloud that I yeah. passed was, it totally threw me off. And there's video of this. And, and you can see my instructor coming closer and closer and closer to me because he was like, it's pull time. Yeah. <laughs> and so you see me looking at my altimeter and I'm just like, and I'm looking and I remember thinking like, I'm supposed to be doing something, <laughs> but I'm still I'm like, I'm really like falling really fast. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which should have prompted me to like do what I needed to do, <laughs> but it didn't. Um, it finally did. And you know, cause I'm, I'm very new at this and I was supposed to pull at I think five or 45. Probably. It was like almost 35 when I finally, and you, he's You'll like, I thought time. I was gonna have to pull. So like he, you, you know, get was, time. Yeah. How many jumps do you have now? Um, on my own, I only have 13. I have six tandems. <laughs> That's fine. So. Tandems are a great intro. So you got 19 total jumps. Yes. Keep going and get your A license because then you can. I know. So that was the whole point. I was trying to. So I got qualified in San Diego. At Skydive San Diego? Yes. Nice. And winds are pretty much the same way every time. Yep. You're I feel land like towards it's. Towards the ocean. I feel like the DZ is gigantic and I have tons of room. I move up to Elsinore. And I am the biggest mess up there. Like I walked out of every one of my AFF landings. Mm-hmm. I get to else. I'm the PLF queen. Like I cannot figure it, out. It's different. It's well, you get used to the visual. Skydive San Diego is very linear. You know, it's east to west runway. Yes. The grass area is east to west, and yes. you're just going to make a very 90 degree centric yes. approach because the wind is almost always blowing from the west west to east. Right. Yeah, Elsinore is just a little bit different. That's a north to south oriented runway. Yeah. The smaller grass landing area. Yes. And so I keep saying this and everyone's like, it's the same size. And I'm like, I'm telling you. <laughs> it might be because, it might be the same size, but it's a different well, visual. And that's what I, you know, because I was like, at, at San Diego, the experienced jumpers, they just, you know, you have the same mm-hmm. length. They just go on the inside. You go Correct. on the outside. Elsinore, they have just, they cut it off because you have that square, that, that grass, grass square, square where yeah. the, the experienced jumpers land. And then... The rest of it's for the students, but I'm like, I don't know. I feel at Elsinore, I'm worried about the dirt bike tra- track. That's you know, don't fly over the dirt bike track. Um, don't go past the, yeah. the hectagon to yeah. the experienced jumpers. Don't go to the runway. You know, and it's like I feel like there are so many other obstacles that I'm worried about, and I just I don't know. I can't. You I'm could go. You could go crank out some fun jumps at uh, San Diego, where you're more used to the visual, yeah. just to get some experience. Because that at some point you'll have enough experience where you can kind of just eyeball it, and you're like, okay, I'm going to turn. Here's my downwind, crosswind into the wind, and you just you have it figured out. Yeah. So that's why I, well, I'm not current anymore, so I got to go do my ground school. Trash. <laughs> well, of course, because you're off long range shooting. <laughs> Scott, having, what else are you picking up? Well, at the same time, I was like, oh, let's fly helicopters too. That sounds fun. So, yes. Yeah. And then so like aviation. I yes. Like I cannot afford all this shit. So. You might be able to use, if you have GI Bill remaining, you might be able to use it for aviation. Yes. I would, I'd have to go, I think I have to get my private first and then you can, you can go use to it a, for everything beyond. Yeah. So something like that, but I have my yeah. uh, licenses. It's a very fun pursuit. Are you fixed wing or helicopters? Fixed wing, but some of them would translate over like uh, the instrument rating. Yeah. So actually, what they said is I should have done fixed wing first because it's a little bit cheaper, and then yeah. you can do the helicopter rating after, after that. Yeah. yeah. And so because helicopter lessons freaking expensive i actually have a desire to learn how to fly those but there's nothing up here there's nowhere to do it up here so i'm super limited oh. but yeah because i uh went pretty deep down the aviation route so i did my private my instrument commercial multi-engine uh and then atp so i have all of the licenses i do, but i have zero um rotary wing time yeah controlling the aircraft i get plenty sitting in the fucking back <laughs> <laughs> yes it's different it's, yeah. you know, you're doing three things at one time. The yeah. first time I was like, I am never going to get this because 
They're like, just, just small inputs. I'm like, I am doing small inputs. Like, ah, I got this. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they call it the rodeo when you yeah. first start flying because you're just all over the place. Well, and, then, and you watch people. That, I mean, they're basically fingertip and they yeah. are doing very small movements. Yes. Yeah. And so once it, it finally came together, I'd say about my fourth lesson that my brain finally understood how little of an input that you're supposed yeah. to put in. And then, but, you know, once you put an input in one, you have to correct the other two. We're talking two. three axes here. It is, yes, and it's it's a lot to think about, but it is once you get it, you it it comes together, and so and then I have gone you know a couple months without flying, yeah. and then thinking like oh here we go, I gotta relearn all this stuff, and and it just I automatically am able to hover and that's good and take off and everything. So God, I wish there was a rotary wing place nearby. It's just there's some awesome things about the Flathead Valley, and then there's some. It's like damn, yeah. So and then how are you liking the long range shooting? I absolutely love it. Like I, it's like half art, half science. It is. I mean, there's so much that goes in the one shot. I love that. Like I love analyzing things. And um, the unfortunate part is there aren't many long ranges out where I am. Um, and then when I went to buy my stuff, mm-hmm. again, surrounded by all these people who know all the stuff, but really, because I was concerned about the optics I'm like what kind of optics should I get and I think I got 50 different answers of, oh you will you will, get, answers you will that, get the answer of what the individual you're asking likes the most right or is sponsored by right and and but they speak to me like I have any freaking idea what they're talking about and I'm just like <laughs> so it's like 50 different answers in different languages and I'm like yeah. I don't know like that helped me I'm a beginner. What would you suggest? Like, Can you send me an Amazon cat. link, please? Yeah, I'm like, just give me a fucking link. Like, what is so hard about this? So really didn't get any help. So when I went to buy my rifle, I talked to the guy on the phone at the gun shop, which is probably the last person I should have talked to because if he didn't have experience in that, he wouldn't know. Um, he suggested a SIG Tango 4. Okay. <laughs> SIG's a great manufacturer. They are, but the optics, um, because I was like, oh, I don't know, I guess a basic, you know, reticle, whatever. Yeah. Um, I learned within my first lesson that, no, I (laughs) need a little bit busier and then I couldn't hold over and I hit a mile on my first day, but I couldn't hold over enough on mine. So I had to use my instructor's rifle and optics. So once you get a system that's dialed in an optic that's paired really well with a rifle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hitting things at a mile, you realize pretty quickly is less of a big deal. Yeah. It's yeah. If you have the right tool in front of you and an understanding of the mechanics, I would say just about everybody could ring a plate at a mile. Yeah, and then like you know, a thousand yard, like it's just like, ding ding. I mean, it's yep. you know, um, assuming you have the right tool. Yes, but even with my little my little tingle, I can yeah, I can go out to twelve hundred pretty yeah pretty well. So. A, a lot of that's based off mechanics though too, and making sure. I mean, once you have a good zero on that stuff, it really yeah. helps. It's nothing like going to a range, shooting long distance with a shitty zero, and you're like, is it me or the gun? Yeah, that's the best question to ask yourself. You're like, fuck, yes. my confidence. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um. So what do you no. want to do in that world? Do you just do it as a as a hobby? Are you can ever, I think they do long no, gun competitions. Assassin's pretty lucrative career these days. So, an assassin, <laughs> Jesus! You're in the <laughs> patching people up department. You don't want to be making the holes. Well, I mean, you got to create your business, right? <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna? Uh, do you still do? I mean, what do you do occupationally now? Are you still in the like you're working with the organization? Still in the medical field? I, yeah, so I work. Um, I I actually fly on an air rescue team with the sheriff's department. That's a volunteer um, position, and then that's just to keep it. I love search and rescue, and I love ropes and you know repelling and hoisting and all that stuff. So that's just to keep that part of my brain satisfied. And yeah. then I work in a hospital per diem in a PACU, and then I my full time job is with Combat Medical Systems, which is it's a private company, but we cater to DOD and federal agencies. So kind of keeps my foot in the door with that. You're okay. diversifying too, which is something I found I have to do. I have, I like, I do the podcast. I love training jujitsu. I love doing public, spe- like I, yeah. I, I, I'm not good at just, this is what I do. And it's just like a pin. I do much, much better. Yeah. But I also have found that I could have too many pins out there. Uh huh. Because so, I, I need another hobby, like I need another hole in my head. And like, that's <laughs> and my personality. So when I retired, I, you know, I I'm pretty sure everybody goes through it and there's transitions. Like, what am I going to do? I you know, like, am I going to have the same income that I was making, whatever? So I piled. I don't even know how much on top of my plate. And so, yeah, you can. 
not only took those hobbies, but I think I had like four different, di- I mean, it was just, yeah. it was a mess. You're an inch deep and a mile wide. Yeah. It's, I don't do yeah. good with that. I need two or three things that I can really dive into. And then yes. I feel at a personal level, it's very satisfying. Yes. And that's what I'm still learning. What are those few things that, that will keep me content, I yeah. guess. So um, keep searching. I've been out longer than you now. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, it's okay to pick stuff up and be like, you know what? This isn't it and move on. Yeah, and so and that was hard too because I've never quit anything, and so it's not quitting. It's yeah. just a realization that <laughs> it's just think of it this way: instead of saying I'm quitting this, it's like you know what? I'm just going to find something that's a better fit for me. Right, and that's you know, and that's I've I've done that a couple of times this year, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm that person who's like jumping from job to job, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't. The only job I ever knew I wanted to have was the one that I did for 17 years, and then everything beyond that is like, right. hold my beer. Right, let's see how this goes. Yep. <laughs> So, exactly, so looking back, um, like I said, I've very few. Actually, you're the only. You're the second woman I've had on, wow. who was in the military. Now I've had other women on, but mm-hmm. it was in the military. The first one was Jessica Lynch, which was oh. awesome to reconnect with her because I was part of that uh, rescue in Iraq. Oh, okay, it was very cool. She had never talked to somebody on my side of the house who was part of it, and I had never had the chance to do anything other than she passed me in a hallway on her way out on a stretcher. So that was very cool. Wow. But looking back. 24 years in the military as a woman how was the military experience for you because it's a boys club i mean let's be honest it's the vast majority of people from a statistical perspective are men yes and uh i've heard some horror stories sexual harassment sexual assault just being pestered consistently how was it for you um i you know i just i've never had really any issues I mean the biggest issue because and I've been around I've been the only female in most of my units when I was enlisted yeah um the only issue would have been when I became a star requirement I had a few guys you know like you don't belong in my fucking community get the fuck out type of thing and what I tell people is that you know stop stop screaming about it or bitching about it put your freaking head down and work and prove that you belong there and you know, yeah, as a woman, you're going to have to do better than the average man because to gain that respect, you can't just be average in in those communities. So that I, I've never really experienced, you know, have people maybe attempted to be appropriate. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's kind of how you approach it. <laughs> you know, it's like you've got to be assertive and you have to put your foot down and like that's not OK. And yeah, I think I'm, there's a degree I mean, I would call those people predators. And I, and one thing that yeah. I hope people realize is that predators get very good at picking out their prey. Right. And there are, and it's, of course, that's not like a magic recipe. Just because you are assertive is not a magic recipe that it's not going to happen. But the way you carry yourself, right. the way that you hold yourself, the way that you are, so it can make a difference for sure. Yes. At, at the very least, if somebody is a predator, they'll be like, nope, on to the next. Because they want the easiest victim. Right. You know, right. the predator that's seeking out the most difficult victim, I'm actually concerned about that. Because yeah. <laughs> most of them are. They're going the other direction. They're right. going for minimum resistance. Right. And I've always, you know, when you get to know me, I they, people know I speak my mind and I'm assertive. And, you know, if I don't agree with something, you're going to know about it. So I don't think I'm that target that people look for her as far as, you know, yeah. am I going to be able to take advantage of her um, in that sense? So would yeah. you recommend military service to women if they come to you? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it was great. Like I have no regrets with anything and it, it put me on a path that I needed to be on because if I had just gone to college after high school, I don't think I would have made it. I would not have. I was not uh, emotionally prepared for that. Right. Which is crazy because they gave me a machine gun (laughs) (laughs) under a lot of supervision and guidance and training. Yes. Well, that's difference, right? So you had structure and you had, you kind of acquire, you know, you go from two parents to like 40. 40. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, you know, you're, it's just structure, routine, and, and it's something I think I really needed. So, um, and it gives you skills and experience that you're not going to get anywhere else. So yeah, I, I'm totally for it. I mean, just know that, you know, you, there are going to be some obstacles and, yeah. you know, as a woman in the military and being the minority, you're going to have to carry yourself a certain way, you know? So. And you know what I would add to It's also not for everybody. No, it's not. It's, nope. uh, I think it's a great, I love the fact that it is an option for everybody, but I also am so thankful for the fact that, you know, 
I've heard a couple people say, I think Tim Kennedy was the last person I heard say it, you know, it's harder to get in the military than it is in Ivy League school. And I'm glad for that because yeah. there's some consequences. One, if you make it in, you're going to be shouldered with a lot of responsibility and it right. can have cascading effects on people if you if you go to the dark side. Right. And I, I just think that, you know, I, I've been seeing with this generation that they question everything, everything, <laughs> which is not bad, but you Time have to also, yes, you have to understand you're going in the military. There are yeah. reasons for, you know, the rules and, and regulations and everything else. And, you know, there are reasons why you don't question your NCOs or whoever at certain times, you know, because that's the key at certain times. I right. have no problem explaining to people anything and everything, but there are times where the explanation is not going to happen because it's, right. there's no time for that. Right. Right. And that's, it's a matter of lives and the people that are standing next to you. So you can't question authority when you're getting shot at or whatever, you know, whatever it is, you have to go with you it. You can. So. The outcome might not be what well, you want it to be. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's an available option. Yes. It's not a good option. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, yeah, if you go into it, you need to know that, you know, there is going to be time where you need to bend to authority and, and take orders and then, you know, just know when, yeah, if something seems unreasonable, when the time and place is to question that too. So, yeah. um, but I, th I feel like this generation has a real hard time with the authority part of it and being told what to do. And, they do. Well, they're yeah. being, I mean, again, <laughs> and from my perspective, they're being told that nobody should be able to tell you what to do. Right. And I don't know. I think it's an interesting experiment. I, I also yeah. think like the pendulum swings. Yes. Just like politically, it's like, yes. oh, we're going to go left and right. And I think most of the time you're like in the 60% that's not the 20% on each side. Right. So who knows? I mean, right. it's an interesting experiment. And I yeah. hope that it doesn't stick long term. Because I don't personally think that it's, you know, I don't think participation trophies and telling everybody that they're a special no. and unique snowflake is a great idea. Yeah. But I'm also an idiot. Yeah. So maybe it is a well, great idea. I'm an idiot too. But again, the no, pendulum's I mean, going to swing regardless of what I think and I, I we'll find our way. Yeah. Life just it's not fair. And you know, and honestly like my first experience out of the bubble of the United States was Haiti and it really woke me up. Oh yeah. And to see people actually live in, you know, sheets and tents and whatever and that's their way like they don't know anything else and yeah. standing in line for water and standing in line for food and running you know babies running after us and diapers and barefoot or not even diapers but no nothing underneath yeah. a t-shirt and bare feet to beg for some water like it's like wow <laughs> i was in kenya and there was a woman who walked to the clinic to give birth and then put the baby in a wheelbarrow and walked home the same day mm -hmm. That is a level of hard that I don't possess. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, and like people in this country don't Fuck. understand, you know. So like when I say things or I'm questioning something or, you know, whatever, like I, you know, I have a little experience in other parts of the world and other, you know, like parts of life that I'm drawing from. And this yeah. is why I'm questioning this. So it's okay to question those things, but yeah, it's, it's, I just would, I think people, I honestly think people should have to do like either military or do, you know, some sort of overseas volunteer assignment or something just so they see like, you know, I we're agree pretty more. freaking fortunate here. <laughs> yeah, I could not agree more. I think it would really round the corners on a lot of the social interaction and behaviors. Yeah. I really, I think empathy would go up. I think appreciation right. would go up. Yep. Uh, and I think everybody would just simmer down it would yeah. turn the burner down on the pot just a touch yes. and then maybe we could stop being such a bunch of idiots yeah. well you know and i and i'm going to say something probably unpopular but like politics right i feel like we're so divided because we're we're always talking about the social side of politics which i really feel like most people can agree on I don't care what you do with your life. I don't yeah. care who you love. I don't care who you want to marry. I don't, you know, like yeah, whatever, like live your life, you, your body, whatever. I'm more economics, national security, foreign Same. policy, you know, and if you talk to people, they would agree with you. <laughs> and that's, the, that's like, if you just stop and talk to people instead of calling names and whatever, because you formulate a thought in your head of what you think they're thinking, you know, it's just, 
crazy. And like, you know, like some of these people who yell at me on, on Instagram, I was like, you're just a stupid trumpet. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you even know? Like, that's who I support. Like, you I haven't just... heard that term, but I'm going to use it today. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Trumpet. Not trumpet, to you. Trumpet and Trump bimbo. And like, I, I don't know. I've been called all kinds Trump of stuff. Trump bimbo? Trump bimbo, yeah. God, I've been missing my opportunity to use these terms. Yeah. And I'm just like, you're making assumptions of my political views and who I support based on because you think I don't support masks, which again, isn't true either. So yeah. like you just made all these assumptions about me that are completely false. There's not <laughs> just, a political uh, organization or category that I completely agree with. Yeah. I got some stuff on the right I like, some stuff on the left I like, right. mostly in the middle. And right. guess what? There's really no category for that. Yeah. So, But most people are in that middle. I agree. Right? And it's like if you just stop and have that conversation, you probably would agree on a lot of things. <laughs> So it's just, it's, I, it's mind blowing that people are killing each other in the streets, literally yeah. for, you know, things they've made up in their head. So yeah, it's, it's sad. Speaking of conversation, how can people get a hold of you? I got to get you at least headed towards the airport so you can get on your plane. Oh, yes. What, what's the best way for people to find you? Probably Instagram. Just, the IG. The IG. <laughs> just don't come at me. <laughs> you have to tell them your Instagram name. It is fly underscore girl underscore rn yes yes closing thoughts just thank you for having me it's thank you for pleasure. making the trip what are you yeah. talking you're the one who came up here well i was you know i was hoping to spend more days here because montana I've like I i'll just, just come back we're not going anywhere yeah I'll, I'll be back but yeah i love montana i was like oh i'd love to spend just a couple of days and go look around and if you're a winter sport person i would say come jan feb Better, it's a little bit low tide right now up there. And then summers, I would say July, August. Nice. That would yeah. be the best. And uh, yeah, you won't want to leave. Yeah. It's an amazing place. I'm, I wish I had lived here for longer than three years, but it began to drag me out of here kicking and screaming. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think this is sort of where I want to end up, somewhere in this area. So yeah. Thank you for having me. You're it's welcome. A pleasure. Right on. We'll enjoy your hunt. Thank you. All right. <laughs>